This is Changeling the Podcast. Welcome to Changeling the Podcast. Come for the glamour, stay for the vibes. I'm your host, Josh, and with us is your host, Puka. Say hi, Puka. Hello. What are we talking about today, Puka? We are cracking open a recently released Chomker from the Storyteller's Vault entitled In the Realm mm. of Gods and Dreams, and we are fortunate enough to be joined by its author, Sebastian. Hi, Sebastian. Howdy. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So yeah, this is one of our interviews. This book is big. We yes. could probably do one of our three-parters on this, no problem. So, but we will be doing interviews for this. So, uh, it is most impressive. I mean, yes, like beautifully done. Just want to thank you. I'm going to get all the plaudits out before we actually dive in. But mm-hmm. sure. And the cover art, I just uh, I'm staring at it for. I assume this was like a commissioned piece or something, but it's just beautifully, beautifully done. Oh yeah, I've been working with Tommy Lee for quite a while. Um, I really like his work too. Yep. Nice. So yeah, this is a long awaited book. I think it's fair to say people have been looking forward to this for several months now because you've been kind of posting about it and talking about it online. This is the much needed update to the Xian in Changeling the Dreaming. But before we get into like the genesis of the book, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into role playing and especially how you got into writing stuff for role playing games? Yeah, you did warn me you were going to ask me that. Um, I did. Okay, so I don't want to give a year because I feel like it'll turn <laughs> me into dust and then I'll just vanish. But I started in the 80s, if that helps you. Okay, <laughs> that, does, <laughs> that does make me feel better. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I got my start with role-playing games in general. I guess I'll say when, when the, the fallout from the Year of the Lotus was still pretty fresh. Mm. And the debate over whether it has a lot of potential or whether it's just trash was raging, I would say. Yeah, Young May started with Vampire the Masquerade Revised and then, you know, straight on to Kindred of the East. And so I was also around when Land of Eight Million Dreams was a rare collector's item. I don't know if you guys remember that, but like oh, yes, there was indeed. a there was a contest on the on the White Wolf website to get a copy. And Can I tell you something? Sure. I, I won that contest. <laughs> no that's, kidding. that's how I got my copy. Yeah. Oh, wow. So Yeah. And um, when I decided to start this particular project, Gods and Dreams, I realized that I hadn't looked at the book in a while. You know, and I, I gave all my physical copies away some time ago. And I realized, like, oh, you can just go on Drive Through RPG and get it for 10 bucks. Yeah, it's a whole different world we live in now. Um, <laughs> but I'm sorry. To the point of... Um, how I got started writing. Well, so for some reason, Kindred of the East discourse had started again um, a few years back Mm -hmm. and I'd always loved it. I'd loved Kindred of the East. I I know it. Yeah. I guess what do the kids call it? Problematic fave. I, 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 I I loved it. I'd seen so much potential in it and I saw people kind of trashing it and calling it, you know, like it's, it's just, it's not worth saving and it's impossible to salvage. And for some reason, I, I think it maybe it's because of the pandemic and we're all sitting inside, but I, I just kind of thought, well, let me see if I can do something about that. And so I made a couple of attempts. I, I, I did a, a short document called Analects of the Damned uh, for setting. Mm. And then I did another one the following year called Record of the Hungry Dead. That was for systems. And they were decently well received. And actually, I, I guess this was one of the questions on your Discord. They, they asked, why did I get rid of those projects? I think they're referring to those two, Analex and uh. Record. I got rid of them um, because I'm pretty sure people who already bought them, they'll, they'll have them and they're kind of amateurish. So they make me cringe that that's <laughs> essentially why. However, if there's a big clamor to bring them back, that's okay. I can bring them back. They're just put on private right now. But in any case, those were the first two. And then, and I was like, Oh yeah, I, I did it. I proved to people it, that kinder of the East can be salvaged and that it's worth saving. And I kind of sat there and thought, okay, no, wait, I'm, I'm not happy. Something about me is, is not pleased yet. And I thought, I, I want to make, like a book, like a book book, like a, like a core. Cause these last things had been like 20, 30 pages. Mm. And so, um, 2023 kindred of the East, the relentless age comes out. It's 200 pages. And then people asked me what I wanted to do next. 
And somebody said, well, given your name, you must want to do Land of Eight Million Dreams. And I thought, actually, yeah, I do. Um, so that's a Reader's Digest version of this whole journey. Would you say that you have been a fan of The Little Gods since Land of Eight Million Dreams? Or did you kind of... Because there was, there's been so much sort of back and forth, talk about cringe, about that book in particular through the years. And I wonder if you've kind of... Have you been a fan of them the entire time? Or did you kind of come around to them later? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, actually, in preparation for this episode, I did listen to your episode on the book. Another one that should have been a three-parter. Well, we interviewed someone who... who, That's right, yeah. Yeah, That that was an interview. Yeah, very knowledgeable person. Um, Yeah, you guys are brutal, (laughs) but deservedly so, I think. Mm -hmm. Everything was well-reasoned. I don't want to say it was was not just a takedown or something like that. But yeah, I I was a fan from the very beginning. Um, If we're going to talk about that White Wolf contest, I was one of the people who threw my hat in as well. So it's actually really cool that I, I get to meet the winner. But I don't want to claim that my entry was like particularly good or anything, though. Like I, oh, I don't we, even remember who was judging it, but I don't know. Uh, I'm yeah. sure it was great. And, and we were all young, so. It's true. But yeah, so ever since I could remember, you know, back when, if you didn't have the book, Amazon back then, you know, um, was just getting off the ground. You could only rely on like GeoCities web pages, mm. and um, so I'm I'm reading my copy of Kindred of the East. I think I got a copy of Blood and Silk, and I'm trying to figure out cobble together like what the Shen are all about. And I'm using this GeoCities web page that was like dark blue with white text in Times New Roman. I think you guys might remember that page. I do. And, yeah, yeah. And yeah, and I'm trying and, and I'm like trying to I'm like these powers don't make any sense. They're not like anything that that I saw in Vampire, and so I was a fan before I even had the book in my hands, which was maybe a couple years after that. Hmm. That was the question, right? How long I've been a fan? Uh, yeah, basically. I mean, okay. if you've adopted it as your screen name, we, oh, that. we assume that you had some long standing. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. That that was actually just, I needed an, I needed a nickname. That's all. Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> that brings up though, another question. Like, what's your relationship, if any, with Changeling the Dreaming more broadly? Mm. Like, have you had... Oh, sure. Yeah, so that one, I mean, I... I devoured everything White Wolf at that mm-hmm. time. Um, and Changeling, yeah, I remember cha- like, wow, full color, you know? And wow, this like Celtic mythology that I, I don't actually know all that well. So it's it sounds it, <laughs> it sounds so authentic, you know? But um, <laughs> yeah, I know. But I, I'm pretty sure the teardown we did on Land of Eight Million Dreams we could do <laughs> the same on a mythological basis for Changeling the Dreaming. But <laughs> yeah, I remember it, it was, um, I mean, not to be too punny about it, but I, I was I was very enchanted by it from a very early age. Um, yeah. Okay, wait, let me specify. I was enchanted by the idea. Mm-hmm. I loved imagining what could be, you know, like, oh, this kind of story would be awesome. This kind mm-hmm. of character would be awesome. And then you sit down and you're like, okay, how does this all work? And, yeah. and trying to read like the banality rules and the, the way that the arts work and the chimerical versus weird. It, well, yeah, that that was very much kind of running into a wall. So, but it stayed, you know, like this this beautiful thing in my mind. The core book was great. The second edition core book, I loved the the supplements that would just expand the world with. Hey, here are these Fey who have been around all this time. Like the anime book, hmm. Denizens of the Dreaming. Like suddenly, you know, like it would every every new book would just expand the world more and more. Um, I really love, and that that's why yeah, that's part of why I liked Land of Eight Million Dreams so much. So you mentioned also the Kindred of the East, the Relentless Age book that, was it last year that it came out at this point? Yeah, last year, last okay. uh, April. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how did the process of going through that book and putting that together inform this one, if at all? Oh, yeah. I mean, okay, so I'm going to do a little caveat for that person who asked if about crossover potential, potential for the Hungry Dead and the Little mm. Gods. I have not tested that the systems for that. So I don't actually know if they would work at a table, but in terms of the setting, yes, they're supposed to be in the same world. So you've done as much crossover testing as White Wolf ever did. (laughs) Yes, essentially. But yeah, so Relentless Age, I would say that the Relentless Age, and and, yeah, I don't want to talk about it too much because I know this is a changeling podcast, but that was where I kind of generated the ethos of how I would do these books, which is, it's hard to describe, but you know, like classic Year of the Lotus stuff, there was this like sense of like, well, either Asian people are wrong or you cross over to the Asian continent and the universe changes its laws. You know what I mean? <laughs> Neither of which is a great option. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And 
what's that that before we called it memes but you know people would say asian people have different souls hmm. so i kind of tried to build a world of darkness where dharmic considerations dharmic reality and by dharmic i mean the wheel of reincarnation the role of karma um the role of dharma which is for those who don't know it's basically like seeking seeking truth i tried to to create a universe where those things are 100% absolutely true you do reincarnate you know all the the realms in the universe they are different places that people are reborn to and basically you know that that existence is is very cyclical and everything kind of fits into this great cycle so i'm sorry i'm i'm, I'm speaking very abstractly but you know like <laughs> like for example there's our world there's there's the human world and then in the western conception of things you say oh there's the umbra there's the shadowlands there's the dreaming which somehow is not connected to any any of the rest of the umbral realms right um, there's the astral realms. When I designed in Relentless Age, I tried to say, okay, no, the, these are all co-equal realms in a cycle of existence. So you have a realm of ghosts. You have a realm of demons, which is a thousand hells. You have a realm of beasts, technically, which is, you know, the, the spirit wilds, you know, I know they're not all animals in there, but basically I cast it as the realm of beasts. And the dreaming, you know, is is the realm of gods and dreams. So by doing that, by by putting them in these terms that are kind of, um, for anybody who's familiar with, I guess, standard Buddhism, those are kind of the realms that people are reborn into. You know, when you die mm -hmm. and you're reborn, you, you could be reborn as a ghost or as a demon or as a human, which is supposed to be the best outcome. Yay. So, yeah, exactly. So that was generated in Relentless Age and it continued on in Gods and Dreams. The little gods, they exist in this world, in this brief time, in what's called an incarnation. And they are kind of at the epicenter in the human world of all these different worlds kind of colliding, interacting in this cyclical dance of existence. But uh, I'm getting abstract again, so I, I think I'll end yeah. there. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, and you describe it as an ethos, which I think is the right way. Because when I compare that with the ethos that must have been in place for the Year of the Lotus books, it's, I would say, much less nuanced, I think is probably the most polite way to put it. But also, you you took the approach of doing this kind of open dev process, maybe the best way to call it, where you kind of posted um, drafts and excerpts and stuff online and got feedback and mm -hmm. went from there. So how did you come to that process? You know, um, not, not just the sort of setting stuff, but the actual writing and engaging with your eventual audience. Yeah, so when I was writing those those precursors to Relentless Age, and then when I was writing Relentless Age live on RPGNet, two reasons. One is I was not very confident in my systems building ability at the time, as well as without getting too deep into my own background, I have enough knowledge from my heritage of, of kind of the East Asian sphere. But when it comes to Southeast Asia, South Asia, you know, other places, I would have to rely on research. So mm. by doing this open dev process, uh, I don't know if you've ever been on RPG Net, but people love talking systems there. They will, <laughs> if you if you have something that doesn't work, they will gladly rip it apart for you. But also, you know, there's all, there was a big chance that I could um, get input from people from cultures other than my own so that I could have that perspective that's necessary to write something with, with good sensitivity. And that actually did happen. So I'll give a, I'll give a concrete example. Uh, no more talking in abstract terms. So when I was writing for the Gods and Dreams, I did um, the Dokebi. Dokebi is a type of goblin in Korean mythology. Okay. And I gave a particular draft. I did a presentation of the Dokebi who they were green skinned, brutish, sort of barbaric and uh, they like they like to fight and they're very wild um, and they're very ugly demon like i had a pretty good idea that that was what a dokebi is from speaking with people uh, i posted this and one of the rpg net users who's from south korea said uh that's actually i want to say he he said it it had a lot to do with the japanese colonial influence at the time mm. and how their conception of oni kind of got blended into the korean conception of dokebi and that kind of lingers and so you know when you speak with people in america a lot of the korean american population they're descended from people who came here in the 70s and 80s mm. so this kind of scholarship that says actually dokebi in the in the authentic korean sense they're not quite like that they are different that kind of scholarship that's happened more recently 
So you would need to talk to, for example, someone from South Korea who's posting on RPG Net to get that kind of dirt. So the version of the Dokkebi that are in the book now, they are more accurate to the way that, that they're understood, I think, by the Korean people now. And that's just one example. Um, another good one was, it's kind of subtle, but like in the Singapore section, two examples. There's the Mare Lion, who I think everybody knows what the Mare Lion is, mm. or the, the mascot of Singapore. But um, a reader who, a couple of readers who were from Singapore, and they said, you know, actually what's, what's really funny is kind of the unofficial mascot of Singapore is the otter who has been making a huh. comeback ever since they've been cleaning up their waterways. And these otters, they're very clever, they're very cute, but they're also very vicious. They like oh, they yeah. like attacked some British tourist, you know, yeah, while <laughs> well, he was out then. jogging. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know. So because of that, you'll see in this in the section on Singapore, I have the river melusine, who are, mm-hmm. you know, they're they're seabirds, but they're also otters. And the reason that they're placed there was because of that input. Yeah, so it's it's stuff like that that like synergies and um I guess I can get into more examples of that kind of development as we go further on um, in this yeah. discussion. But yeah, that's that's why I did what I did. The um, yeah, the the second reason that I decided to live draft on RPG Net, um, aside from the the systems and the culture stuff that was very helpful, was that I grew up on Live Journal and I was just kind of comfortable in that particular atmosphere of of kind of posting things publicly. So that was a really good experience for Relentless Age, Gods and Dreams. You know, for this. For anything that I do next, I might try to challenge myself and actually just try to sit down and be alone um, and not get constant validation. <laughs> but we'll see. We'll see in the future. Who needs validation, really? <laughs> Everybody. Yeah. Everybody deserves it. There you go. So shall we start flipping some pages? Sure. Yeah. Let's virtually, because it. it's a PDF. Yeah. Oh, this is this is one of those that really makes me sad. We can't have print on demand. Yeah. On Vault. Oh yeah, I would have I would have one hundred percent tried to if they'd allowed it. Mm-hmm. maybe someday and there's so many art pieces in here that i was like oh i remember that from various second edition <laughs> books of yours yeah that's good i tried to pick them carefully so we open up we have yeah some... i'll let you guys take the lead all right we have some splashy pages i guess we should just we can just move right into the intro and stuff i mean yeah i encourage people to look at the preview on storytellers fault you'll see what the first several pages look like mm-hmm. yep so we get some opening fiction, a little vignette about a young man dying in a pirate attack on the Mekong River, where he gets his throat cut, comes back as a fish man, and exacts justice. Which is the kind of thing that is frankly a lot more engaging than the convoluted sort of court romance prologue myth in Land of Eight Million Dreams. Oh yeah. I don't know what else some... to call it, but Yeah, no. Um as much as I loved uh, Land of Eight Million Dreams, much like Changeling as a whole, was something where I just kind of loved the idea, the mood, that magical mood. Mm-hmm more than the execution. So that story about the the poor monkey girl getting burned to death by her her husband to be right um, didn't make any sense yeah. and it didn't reflect at all what you were going to play. When it comes to that that story, uh, I had a couple couple goals. One is to show that these people can take dead people as their hosts, just like the classic Shen. And also that, you know, this is happening in real life. Real things are happening with stakes that we understand. You know, hopefully not many people know what it's like to smuggle drugs, but you know the kind of fear that it is from doing doing something illegal like that. So that mm-hmm. those were the goals. And um, also the, the cover art, too. I mean, I was aiming for beauty and color, but it was also, you know, they're standing in front of street mm-hmm. art that's falling apart. One of them smoking a cigarette. One of them's using a cell phone. I just want to show that these are gods who live in our world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's a mood that recurs through the book. I mean, you have these kinds of opening fictions at the start of each chapter that kind of repeat the feeling, so. Mm-hmm. That's good. And then, yeah, it gets the various origin stories. It does reference the Hisian sort of backstory, but as a possibility. And maybe that's mm-hmm. wrong. I like that. <laughs> I like it better when they don't really know and they argue over what things, what the origins yeah, yeah. are. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be World of Darkness if the metaphysics weren't multiple choice. Yep. Then it gets into a sidebar like you do you do the standard like you know introducing what the chapters are and whatnot you get to a sidebar saying like this is essentially a core book and you do change yeah a lot of the rules right and then you get you also have a chapter sort of like how to use it in with the c20 so so what was your motivation there for yeah i mean that's a lot more work to do new core rules (laughs) yeah this is the big enchilada isn't it (laughs) okay and it's funny too i remember like halfway through i i had already made the decision to kind of make this you know, the world that I, the way that I want it to be. 
Mm-hmm. And I was posting, and I remember somebody in RPG Net posted and said, "Like you're just making the same problem happen all over again. That this is a, <laughs> you know, that that these Shen don't don't work well with others." And I was like, "Oh, well, okay, I'm gonna have to address that." But to answer why I did it, at the start, the one idea that I had that that made me decide that this this project was worth tackling was incarnation, which we will get into. Mm-hmm. You know, it just it came to me in the shower, and I thought, "Oh, this is so good. I gotta I gotta make this happen." So I thought, okay, C20 with incarnation, and let's put in some Asian kits, describe some cool Asian chimera, bada bing, bada boom, we're done. Mm-hmm. But I kept going and I realized, I, I thought, I, I felt so constrained by some of the setting conceits, like the idea that, and this is going to get into a, maybe a controversial area, but you know, that, that chimerical reality is, is kind of, there's, there's a sense that it's not as real. Mm. And you could make the argument that it's become less real because of the state of the world, right? But I ran into that and I thought, I really, I really don't like that. I really don't want to run with that assumption. I want everything uh, to be real. I, I would argue C20 kind of didn't art run with that assumption either. But It's true. Yeah, it changed to chimerical aspect, which I think was an improvement, but you still yeah. had that chimerical damage track. Mm-hmm. So it was like, okay, on, on a setting level, I don't like the idea that maybe it's not real. On a systems level, I don't like two different tracks for damage. Mm. Let's, let's try to get rid of it. And from there, once I made that choice, I thought, okay, let's just rehaul this whole thing. Yep. And you went more than just changeling, like you rehauled like the dice system, like the core dice system and things like that. So uh, not too much, I don't think. A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Just just because like a V five level change to it, not a Yeah, it's it's familiar at least. It's not Yeah. I do want to make clear to people who pick up this book that that particular presentation of the rules that you know you, you only add or take away dice that was to make presentation easy mm-hmm. if you want to use difficulty seven eight nine go ahead it's totally fine mm-hmm. i knew it would be a controversial decision but i at this point i thought okay well you know go big or go home part of making this as thoroughly as i did was because so relentless age the hungry dead are, are closely related to the canine vampires so it was not that much of a stretch to say you need v20 you cannot use really anything else mm. but B20 un- unless you're like, you know, you can run story- Storyteller in your sleep, which many people can. But for this one, I thought, you know, I really want it so that people who are not, who didn't pay attention to Changeling, were not into Changeling for whatever reason, and they have a copy of Demon or something. Mm-hmm. I wanted them to be able to just pick this up, use your Demon core that you already have, and go nuts. Yeah. As you could see from the rules chapter, that involved having to explain a lot more than i than i had hoped (laughs) but yeah i think of it kind of like on the level of maybe like it's close to the level that kindred of the east was like it's sort of a core book but sort of not it's it's or even all the dark ages stuff like dark ages fey and dark ages mage yeah that's true yeah so yeah i will make clear for people yet you do need a core book to understand how to roll at all if you're not familiar with this stuff yeah um but you can use pretty much any And, and you don't have, like, the detailed mundane actions. Oh, yeah. No things. electricity rules or anything. Or electrocution. Yeah, or yeah. how to drive a car or how to yeah. do a gunfight or all Which, that. Uh, to be fair, I, I know that those rules exist. I could not tell you what they actually are. So <laughs> Yeah. But if, if you want to use those rules, get a core this book. will work with yeah. them, I think. Yeah, it's not like exactly. Them. Then we get some inspirations. I'm ashamed to say I don't think I've read any of these comics, and I really want to at some point. Oh yeah, they're definitely worth your time. <laughs> Memories of Eminon is really short, so you can you can get that really quickly. Okay. I was a little, you know, I, I have to tell you when I when I made these inspirational sources, I was focusing on like themes, things that deal with impermanence, with the nature of immortality, and it ended up being a lot of anime and manga, and I felt like, oh no, I need to have. But the, <laughs> you know, it's changeling. Like, of course, there's going to be a lot of. It. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, mean... I, I wanted to have, I guess, a much wider cultural survey. Um, like, you know, I have the Jataka Tales and I have the Journey to the West, which is good. But mm-hmm. so, yeah, if actually, you know, I'm, I'm doing a couple Q&A threads on, on RPG Net. And um, if people want to suggest other things, I'm, I'm more than open to yeah. it. You know, it also makes me feel it's like an argument for feeling less guilty about liking Big Trouble in Little China. So, <laughs> Oh, yeah. I've never seen it, actually. I, I know of it, but I have, I've never seen it. Oh, you should. It's yeah, yeah, it's a classic. I've seen it. Yeah. It's very 80s. Just, to, <laughs> just you know, it's true. 
There's a big old lexicon. I don't think we necessarily need to extensive. Yeah. cover no, all that's of a, these. Yeah, but... it's, it's all stuff that <laughs> yeah. shows up later in the book. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have a question here. Maybe we can get into a later chapter about defilement. What about it? How much is that banality and how much is it like very different yeah. from banality? That's what so, you're thinking. Yes. Okay, sure. Yeah, and let's get into it now. Defilement, I think of it as banality plus nightmare, just kind of smushed together. So I, I know that C20 kind of handled this in a different way, but I know that an issue with kind of earlier changeling editions is banality dark magic or is banality, you know, being really, really boring and soul crushing, right? Mm-hmm. I know that that was a cause of many arguments back in the day. And kind of the way that I tried to thread the needle here is, I guess, going back to what I was saying about making kind of a dharmic based reality, you know, in, in kind of the Buddhist sense, what makes something defiled or, or impure or unclean is the intent to harm, to pursue something based on ignorance or anger. Like there's a point at which you can decide, I'm not going to do this. Or you can say, I'm totally going to do this. And when you say, I'm totally going to do this, mm-hmm. this cruel, awful thing, you know, that is a defiled thing. So to define defilement in this game, it's not just um, boredom or apathy. It's the decision to be cruel, to make the world a worse place. Mm-hmm. And in that, it's also bound up with uh, spiritual impurity. And that's kind of linked to this Shinto concept called kegare, which Kegare in, in the Shinto sense, it, it just kind of happens. You know, you live in the world and you just kind of accumulate, you know, spiritual tar. Here, it's a little bit more active than that. Yeah. Sometimes I'm wondering, like, how some of the autumn people could fit into there, if it's aligned or not. And it sort of depends, I guess. But oh, non-malicious, yeah. but still intense banality. How does that? I don't think about that. But yeah. No, um, there are a couple examples of autumn people later on. So we can get into that. Mm-hmm. Okay. It might be worth pointing out that what we don't have in the lexicon are chi and yugen, which were a big mm-hmm. piece of, of 8 million dreams. <laughs> um, so. Oh, I love yugen. It's such a beautiful word. It is. Yeah, so as far as terminology choices went, I pretty much tried to stick to foreign languages if I was talking about a kinship or a kith from mm-hmm. a region, or if it was old enough, basically if it was Sanskrit from some old source then i felt comfortable using it Mm -hmm. but otherwise yeah i tried to stick to english that makes sense and you have this note on page 17 about cultural license with some solid advice about especially navigating linguistic issues but also historical and political and everything so oh yeah i appreciate it. yeah yeah that it's it's funny there are two different sides of the spectrum i know that there are some people who who would be afraid to even try to make a character because they feel like oh i'm not chinese Mm -hmm. this is this is a bad idea. Mm-hmm. And to them, I want to say, no, it's not a bad idea. Just go for it. Then there are other people, you know, who want to say like, oh, um, I want to play a Uyghur <laughs> yeah. uh, in China. I want to play a Tibetan revolutionary in China. And I'm like, oh, um, maybe don't do that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I've, told, I've noticed there's this kind of American view, like a, the view of cultural appropriation, which I definitely agree is a thing, right? Like the problem. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. there's sort of this American take where it's like, if it's not your culture, and you interact with it at all, you're appropriative. Like this extreme mm. that I see a lot. I've online. heard that does I exist. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think this helps sort of combat that idea of you can you can't even play this if you're not from this culture. But that's Right, exactly. I mean, we got into this a little bit with our when yeah. we were talking about the Fay around the world and the player's yeah. guide. And I may have presented a, a more more overcorrection than is strictly necessary. Well, but, there there were some problems with those effects. Like there were. Yeah. But I think it yeah. I think that the advice in here, like if I could distill it into three points, it would be I, I really like the comment about looking for similarities before differences. Mm-hmm. The being sensitive especially about oppressed minorities within the culture that you're looking mm-hmm. at and to put the comfort of your gaming table first. I mean, with respect to playing it. Writing is a different story, but for playing it. Yeah. And I think like I still stick with my principle that before you play one of these characters who you maybe don't have any kind of connection with, you just kind of want to be aware of your own identity in relation to it and ask yourself what draws you to that kinship Mm -hmm. in this case in the first Mm -hmm. place. That's not a do or don't play it directive, but a be aware kind of. That's a beautiful way to put it. I hammer this point or I beat the drum about people being more similar than they are different because... This was something that you got into in your last episode. Uh, I mean, the sorry, not the, the one about Land of Eight Million Dreams. And you know, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't want to require people to listen to it, but it they should. But 
Oh yes, they, they should, but um, yeah, this, this should be self-contained. But the the point that your guest had that there's this constant feeling that Asian people and Asian culture is kind of almost unknowable, which was a problem. Hmm. And I want to hammer home, and I hope that I did um, throughout this text, that um, no, you 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 pretty much understand what people are are about when you look at them, you know. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, they might wear, you know, orange robes instead of a, a priest frock, but essentially it's the same stuff at heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I liked also like you, you going like the most important thing is the people at the table, right? If it's not like a streaming thing, then you have to think about the audience too. But like think about what is the harm here? What are you doing? You know, yeah. you don't want to make light of things even in a small group table. And I've seen it go very badly where people say mm-hmm. storyteller was not taking you to account. Sure, like... I guess maybe, well, this might be putting a little bit confrontationally, mm-hmm. but like I could write 20, 30 pages about um, safety rules, cultural sensitivity. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was almost worried that I would have to, but then I, I kind of sat down and I thought like, if they don't care about other people, why would they care about what I have to say? Mm-hmm. You know? So you just have to care first and then everything else will hopefully follow. We interrupt this interview for a message. <laughs> But right. I think it's good to highlight it too, not just look like I've yeah, seen yeah, it where yeah. people theoretically care, but they didn't, they were caring, but not considerate, I guess. You think mm, they didn't that's good. consider the situation. Yeah, You're like, oh, yeah. the book said this, so I'll do that. But <laughs> yeah. It's great to care, but if you don't actually put it into practice, then what good is it really? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Shall we move on? Yes. Yeah. It's an introduction that does a lot of heavy lifting, but we will mm-hmm. move a little more briskly, maybe. Uh, so chapter one, we have The Golden World in which we get an overview of the setting, I guess. I noticed a lot of what I interpreted as hints of Dark Age's fae through here, and I wondered if that was intentional. What are you referring to? Well, just like the use of weaving, and I guess it was difficult sometimes for me to tell whether you were drawing on, you know, Dark Age's fae, Changeling, the Lost, Exalt of the Fair Folk, any like that, or just the parts of C20 that happened to kind of reflect ah. those. Well, you're right. I was I was actually drawing on all those different things. I, I just wanted to see how obvious it was yeah. by asking you. There's something um, about the, the, the dark and sun, too. I just noticed that's the other piece that I think I was noticing. Yes, yes. So um, weaving was definitely, that was from Dark Ages Fae. Um, there are a couple of exalted references as well. Um, but yes, under the dark and sun, what was it? In, in Dark Ages, it was 1230 that the world ended, mm-hmm. which actually coincides with the time that Genghis Khan was absolutely wrecking half the world. So I thought that worked out really well. But yeah, yeah, those references are are intentional. Right on. So we get information about the chimerical side. So the golden world is just the term for the chimerical side. That's more or less the chimerical aspect, as you call it. Yes. Yeah. So the the golden world. Yes. If if people are from, I mean, while they're listening to the Changeling podcast, I'm sure they'll know. If you want a one-to-one, it is essentially a chimerical reality, just kind of presented in a way that this is the way that the world actually is. And mm-hmm. the fact that people can't see it is because they're cursed with a supernatural blindness. In a way, it's a little bit like um, Changeling the Lost, I guess. I have a question for Sebastian. Have you ever read Nobilis? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah. So it's mythic versus prosaic. I yeah. Think. Yeah. So that that works, too. Um, yeah. No. Yeah. Jenna Moran is goals. I want to be yeah. like her. Yeah, I need to, I, mean, I think next year, next year we can do a Novellus episode, right? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. Now that... I mean, you say that was your question for Sebastian, but that's yeah. your question for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, that, that's how I think of it, like chimerical reality or. Yeah, that's a very, that's a very good comparison. Um, and then mm-hmm. I, yeah, then I go right into why people can't see it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wah, wah. You know, we get the mists. We get information about the living prayers, a.k.a. Chimera, and the lower heavens, a.k.a. the dreaming. I'm using a.k.a., but I do think conceptually, well, yeah, conceptually they are different. They are understood differently within the context of this setting, even if they're referring to the same, like, cosmological space Mm -hmm. or entities. I have a question on Mm -hmm. what is incarnation? I'm not totally sure I understand it. Okay. Incarnation is taking on mortal form. Okay. But mortal form is broad. Technically speaking, a rock is mortal. A tree is mortal. Um, a fish is mortal. These creatures, um, and 
I used a term from, I think, Dark Ages, again, called uh, bygones. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some of them, because they, they don't want to be constrained to their particular environment just to survive, they want to live in the whole world. So mm-hmm. they choose to merge with a host, uh, call it an anchor. Mm-hmm. And most of the time, that's a human anchor, somebody who has recently died, somebody who is yet to be born, um, or somebody who's just living their life and they need a god to merge with. Those are most of them. But then you can also merge with features of the land. You can merge with animals. And once that happens, they are called little gods. It's, I think, I'm thinking a little bit like assumption terms and from Exalt the Fair Folk. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, basically. I mean, I don't want to portray yeah. the, the little gods are definitely not quite that alien. Mm-hmm. You know, they specifically, they love human beings. So mm-hmm. that's really what kind of motivates a lot of them. Whereas other bygones, they don't necessarily care. So, that's so what... you're not incarnated if you're not quote unquote true fey chimera. Like if you're not really part of the mortal world, I guess, or the human world. Or you, if you don't have a reason to really care about human beings and and the things that get they get up to, yeah, you'll be a a griffin in some hidden valley, you know, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. Eat your grass and be happy, you know. But if you're mm-hmm. if you're a griffin who really, really, really wants to ride a subway. You're going to need to mm-hmm. be incarnated. Oh, and then okay. you're the subway griffin. Basically, Perfect. yeah. <laughs> Character idea, sorted. Yeah. Some more uh, sort of call-outs. We have the Demon Hunters in Strike Force Zero, which classic. There's notes about ghosts and the gauntlet. And this is, I think, like one of the, maybe not the main sticking point about Land of Eight Million Dreams, which is its cultural approach, but like there's sort of the next tier of sticking points, one of which is the way that they interact with the other worlds. Yeah, the question of, is it a changeling supplement? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And I don't think C20 really resolved this, the kind of messiness of it. So it's helpful to kind of have, especially for anyone who hasn't played the other games that have the Umbra, this section that spells out the gauntlet and how it works in relation to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember this was an issue in Land of Eight Million Dreams. It was like they were barred from the spirit worlds and that was their whole thing. But somehow the dreaming was not one of those things, except they didn't make it. But they also weren't of the dreaming. Like, yeah. Yeah. So I do want to make clear to people who are expecting Land of Eight Million Dreams, that stuff is no longer an issue. Yeah. Little gods. Yay. Yeah. And they have some opinions on the other night folk, such as the hungry dead and the mages, the half devils. With half devils, are those Fomori or are they the fallen? I wasn't clear. Having not played either, so sure, sure. Um, so, in the Relentless Age, which was set in the distant past of 1998, yeah. half devils. Eternity. Yeah, they were, they were essentially the uh, Fomori. In in the original game, they were called Bakemono, which just means monster. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they were you know people with these like freakish mutations, and they're you know merged with demon energy and things like that. And so, one conceit in this book. Uh, for the half devils is that since 1999 since specifically since june 1999 they have kind of upgraded and they have become more like the fallen in conception they're much more powerful and they're willing to strut their stuff okay because it does seem at points like they are an option for player characters as well that can be integrated into the game very possibly i didn't i didn't write their rules as thoroughly as the little gods but yeah they're there there's some info on how the strange cousins, the other fae, are perceived. Glad to see some merfolk representation. That was nice. Oh, what? The people don't talk about the merfolk that much? <laughs> An- another design goal was, um, I think I called, on RPGNet, I called this uh, the unified theory of changeling. I wanted them all to make sense. And I felt like with incarnation, they could. So mm-hmm. the Cathane, they're kind of slotted into what are called the quickened. And basically, but putting it in terms of an artificial wheel of reincarnation, I just you know, I just wanted to up the Buddhism a little bit. Yeah, it's it's essentially they found a way to guarantee quickened incarnations, and it's mm-hmm. it's actually, I would say that the little gods and the world in general are supposed to look at that and be like, wow, that's really impressive. So hmm. okay, all right. Does this actually cover incarnation for like Arcadian she? as a possibility or mentioned? Like, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, that's uh, yeah, that's a messy one. But, but it, uh, we can go into it. <laughs> but that's in here. Okay, I, could, I missed it yep. on my read through. Okay. Well, briefly, before we get to the types, just the end of chapter one has the cosmological info about the lower and upper heavens. And the upper heavens seems like an Arcadia kind of analog. 
Yeah, I do have to confess one thing. I I don't know or don't have a good grasp on the Nunehi and their situation with the higher hunting grounds. So it's, I'm it's inconsistent. So that's that's how it seems. Yeah. So I want to say that the higher hunting grounds are also part of what would be called the upper heavens, but I don't know. There's a part of C20 that says that. Actually, it's, it's, it okay. calls it like a realm of Arcadia. Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to step on any toes of um, Nunahi fans, but just to say that mm-hmm. that was the intent. Yeah. And we close with a sidebar on 1999. Yes. I like this, actually. Like, this is a nice way of kind of addressing the, you know, in previous editions, like, wait, didn't the world end? Wasn't that a thing that was supposed to happen? And then it didn't. Yeah, yeah I, I had to address this because, especially in the Relentless Age, I really tried to put in this kind of apocalyptic mood of, oh man, the age of sorrows is coming any minute now, any minute now it's going to happen. And Mm -hmm. now we're 25 years into it. And what happened? I hope that I explained it well for people who aren't clued into the year of the Lotus and don't know about this whole age of sorrows thing. Especially with C20 making it 9-11 instead. (laughs) (laughs) But this also, there's, I almost want to call it a hope punk vibe to this sidebar, Mm -hmm. especially at the end, because there's the the idea like, oh, we've been told all the demons are going to break loose and destroy the world and corrupt the world. And it's like, well, here are the demons. They're not all that bad. Maybe we should like make peace with them and work together to move forward Mm -hmm. and avoid the dire prophecies. And that's how you get through. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And I, um, if, if anyone has an opinion on the half devils at all, that um, they might actually feel sorry for them. It doesn't seem like a great life. No. So, anyway, chapter two. Mm-hmm. So there are kind of three axes of splat that are laid out here: the incarnation, the kinship, and the karma. Where incarnation is, I guess, determined by what you're anchored to. Kinship is like the culturally oriented kith equivalent with birthrights and revelry and frailty. And then karma is a philosophy, sort of like a court in terms of having tenets and stuff. Yes. I really liked the idea of the uh, token of merit as well. That was really fun. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I, tr- I tried to make something. So I wanted there to be some kind of mechanical benefit to actually being in a karma. Mm-hmm. Because I guess we're I, I guess we're crapping on Land of Eight Million Dreams again. Um, <laughs> the We don't have to, but it's just so easy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's because I have to make comparisons. So the reason that I made karmas is because of the courts of the Shen mm-hmm. were very hard to understand. Yes. Mm-hmm. And yet it was assumed that you would be in them or or you're you're in the Wu Shen, which means I'm in no court, which I felt like then why do you even have this system if most people are not going <laughs> to be in it, right? So I tried to distill um, the basic philosophies that I saw there. You know, I, I changed the names because I... I the, the transliteration I couldn't trust. So changed the names there, kept the philosophies, and then tried to give it some kind of uh, benefit to be in it. Nice. Yeah, these in a weird way feel more to me like um, Kindred of the East, the Dharmas there. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's intentional yeah. too. So it, it, I tried to make the, the societal kind of structure, you know, and, and I guess in classic mm-hmm. change, then you have this kind of pseudo-feudal, sometimes a parliamentary structure. But for the Asian stuff in general, I I tried to make them into sort of like schools of martial arts or students who gather around a guru, that Mm -hmm. sort of. And then, you know, they they care about their group. They war with other groups, um, but things are a lot more dynamic in that way. So that's why I tried to make the karmas the way that they were, too. So you have the incarnation, which is like, I guess, what kind of changeling you are? Anyway, yeah, we've gone to that before. Kinship is like kiths but broken up into three categories three broad organizational categories yeah yeah. and then karma and you could in theory mix and match like okay in theory you could have any incarnation any kinship and any karma is that right yeah yeah you know yeah you absolutely (laughs) could um and i want to make clear you know the the divisions and the kinships the celestials the earth-blooded and the Mm dream-born you know there there are some like kind of political philosophical considerations but it was really a lot of Mm-hmm. for an organizational purpose so if you want to play a mixed group of everybody you totally can yeah yeah so maybe very briefly if we just go through these the incarnations you have the beloved where you strike a bargain with the human host doesn't always go so smoothly yes the quickened who are born as humans and then later awaken much like changeling Cathane. Mm-hmm. the revived who take over dead bodies as in land of eight million dreams 
the enshrined who are basically in anime i guess but with much more yeah you don't have to be elemental but they have the yeah anchors like in an anime at least yeah that's right yeah they're they are anchored yes mm-hmm. and then the rampant who anchor to animals which was much needed we needed like more of these mm-hmm. so. uh, and then there's also the unhallowed who i guess we'll get to later yes are they kind of like the daunting equivalent kind of uh, yeah. there are a few different things we'll get yeah we'll get into that yeah chapter seven then oh you're right there little sidebar on the unincarnated yeah there we go okay never mind <laughs> So then under the kinships, the sort of categories within each of these three categories, are they intended to be kind of like, I was about to say casts, but I'm like, no, that's the wrong <laughs> term. For oh, sure. I know what you mean. Like they are... Um, Callings, maybe? Yeah, I guess that's the best way to put it. They're, they're organized that way because I felt like those are the archetypes that fit the most number of kinships. Okay. Yeah. I, I think of them like families of kids, maybe? Yeah, exactly. And and yeah. um, they each of the three categories kind of mirror each other across the celestial, um, earth-blooded, mm-hmm. and dreamborn. Well, it also seems like part of it is a self-conception difference, because there's a note about the celestials seeing their true home as being the heavens, which yes, feels if, Arcadian. Yeah. The earth-blooded claim to be the true gods of the mortal world who were exiled to the lower heavens, and then the dreamborn have like the postmodern changeling, the dreaming idea of no, we're born from concepts. And yeah, so yeah, if if I can make a quick compare, I guess the celestials, for the most part, you would see them kind of like the autumn she in C twenty, people who are from heaven but they've been here for a long time, mm. and yeah, the earth-blooded are more like commoners uh, in their traditional sense. And yeah, the Dreamborn, well, also commoners, I guess, but but with that particular C20, like we're born from dreams. I want to make clear, yeah, in, in the way that these Fae see themselves, uh, it's rare for them to think of themselves as born from the human unconscious. They really, that would that's kind of a wound to their pride. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, and I think it changed, like, like C20 did emphasize that, but there's been a lot of change was going, what are you talking about? I'm not made from <laughs> dreams. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, like, if, if you have memories of being a shoemaking elf for 700 years, mm-hmm. why would you think you came from a story? Yeah, yeah and like, a lot of the she killing, I mean, the, no, no, we were made, but we are the children of the Tuatha Da Da we're not dreams at all. But, exactly, yeah. 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 These kinships here, are these supposed to be, like, all-encompassing, or, like, would you be like, I want to make a new one, and that's fine. <laughs> oh, yeah, so there are regional examples in Chapter 6, which we can get into, but mm-hmm. I tried to pick, so for these nine, for three for each of the tribes, I tried to pick ones that have the most broad reach across East, South, and Southeast Asia. So, mm-hmm. like, with the celestial kinships, you'll see the uh, Apsara. Like, yeah, if you're not from India, you might not use the word Apsara. If you're from China, you'll use the term celestial maiden. Mm-hmm. Some, or I think, what is that? Ah, I don't remember the Japanese term. But yeah, they, they have their equivalents across Asia. And then like the next one, the Chilin. So Chilin are very, they're kind of specific to China. But this idea of like a chimera beast that is responsible for good fortune, that you'll find anywhere. So it, it goes mm-hmm. on like that. Yeah. Actually, here's a question. Like the scope, what, what sort of regions is this covering or is it not? Well, Oh, sure. So um, the way I describe it is, I say from from West India to the eastern edge of Japan. You had Mumbai yeah. to Tokyo at one point. I was like, yeah, that works. And oh, OK. Like... That's even better. Yeah. Forgot I wrote that. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's a huge, I mean, I probably more than half the world encompassed there. Um, oh, yeah. So. But you're not necessarily addressing like New Guinea or Siberia or. <laughs> that's true. I, I, well, I'm going to say that I don't explicitly, but I tried to. Build yeah. things so that you could. Briefly, to round out the nine examples we get, mm-hmm. in addition to the Apsara and the Chilin, we also have the Kinara, the Earth Blooded, we have the Yakshas, Kaibu, and Jin, and the Dreamborn, we have Immortal Sages, Shinigami, and Hobbs, who are like the Ur Little Folk, which was mm-hmm. fun. And I dig how like the little story paragraphs that we get at the start of each of these that kind of gives you a foundation. If you're unfamiliar with where these beings came from folklorically, it kind of gives you a point of reference. That's yeah. helpful. No, I'm glad you like them. I uh, will say of the list, if you've got this book, you want to play something and you're really not sure, the author recommends that you just go with an immortal <laughs> sage. <laughs> Noted. 
I, I like too the structure. Like it's it's more structured than what the Kith in Changeling the Dream. Like where you have a greater birthright, lesser birthright, frailty. It feels like you'd be easier if I don't know you were trying to do it from a culture that just doesn't fit in this book, right? But like try to make a new one, it'd be a lot easier to. Yeah, in um, chapter three, I do provide guidelines for how to build a greater birthright, and then I have a list of lesser yeah. birthrights that you can choose from. So yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. Well, we're nearly at chapter three. But before we get there, very briefly, there are also the five karmas with their philosophies. Uh, We have the blood garlands who say power is everything, pleasure, pain, embody all possibilities, and your word is law. Then the dancing bells who say honor your incarnation, mortal life is miraculous, never forsake your bonds. The lions of heaven who say obey the heavens, fulfill prayers to the gods, and defend purity. The uncrowned thunders, who believe glamour is reality, embrace change, obliterate ignorance and slavery. And the wandering pearls, who say memory is life, leave no wonder unseen, and accept endings. So there's a lot of like seely and unseely threads through these, but they are mm-hmm. they are distinctive. Yeah, like, like the first one with the blood garlands, I'm like, that's an interesting interaction with the not banality. Uh, the... <laughs> Defilement. Defilement, yeah. It's an interesting interaction with defilement there. To me, that one's in particular. Well, they sound like devil tigers from... Exactly, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's true. Well, I I do love my devil tigers. But (laughs) yeah, I guess since this is a Changeling podcast, I can give a little bit of a cheat sheet here. So the Blood Garlands and the Uncrowned Thunders, you mash them together, you get the Unseelie Court. And then the Lions of Heaven and the Dancing Bells... You mash those together and you basically I, I, I thought of them as the Sealy Court. And then the Wandering Pearls are kind of the odd one out. They came about circumstantially because of RPG Net, actually, if you don't mind me telling a little story about that. Um, <laughs> Go for it. So I, I had the four karmas and I was like, yes, this is perfect. Four karmas. I'm going to proceed this way. And then RPG Net, for those who don't know, is it's a kind of it's an old style forum. It's been around for a long time and a lot of its members are on the older side. And for a week there, while I was live drafting, we would be getting those black bar messages every day saying so-and-so who was a user on RPG Net has died. You know, our thoughts and prayers are with his family. And then the next day, so-and-so who was a poster on RPG Net, you know, with with this handle has died. Our thoughts are with his friends and family. Even one of the authors for Land of Eight Million Dreams, Mm -hmm. James Mm -hmm. Moore, he he died in this time. It's heartbreaking. And, And I was just like, man, all these people are dying and and sometimes the black bar would say like so and so you know was a prolific author of all these books and all these articles for these rpg magazines and i'd look them up and i'd be like wow they they have so much and i had no idea you know but somebody's mm-hmm. got to care about this somebody and that's kind of where the, the genesis came from the wandering pearls it's yeah somebody will care you hope at least that's beautiful it feels kind of autumn courty if you were to go to dark ages fight but yeah that's mm. a beautiful thing. yeah yeah we have some example circles for each one and like to your point just that like one of the ones for the wandering pearls is heaven's hospice care which is like you know oh yeah hits you right in the field that one that one i yeah i got a little choked up i'm not a, not afraid to say it's yeah. a it's a sad thought to play a game like I, I would probably not want to play a game like this but some somebody might yeah chapter three yes <laughs> on that note yeah, no, I mean, it's it's good to hear about kind of the genesis of these. When you were kind of talking about them, you know, pairing the blood garlands and the lands of heaven and the dancing bell or whatever it is, I was like, oh, are the wandering pearls, are they from my faves, the path of the thousand whispers? But it does seem rather a, a different inspiration. Oh, I mean, that's, you know, the thousand whispers. I like them too. You know, I would say, yeah, a lot of kindred of the East DNA kind of snuck its way in too. Yeah. <laughs> So chapter three is character creation and rules, which is exactly what you'd expect. Mm -hmm. There is a step-by-step process, which... Oh, man. Okay. Can I I complain here? Of course. So I wanted, like I said, uh, people to use any book, any core book to to pick this up and play, right? And I was like, oh, it'll be easy. I don't even have to describe it. Just say, use any core book, the end. (laughs) Yeah, there's a... There's an ability called Kenning. There's an ability called Greymare. C20 doesn't have allies. And so I was like, yep. oh, no. And then Kenning is just awareness. And, yeah, and, I, and, and so I thought, oh, and no. And Greymare's just a cult. <laughs> yeah, and I realized, like, oh, God, I, I, I have to write everything. I have to write everything. <laughs> so that's what I did. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. well, you know, 
it works because then that makes you less reliant on the core box. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. You had also good write up of when you would use appearance. It's actually more relevant yes. than most books. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So we go through the steps. There's the concept. And under concept, you also pick your incarnation, kinship, and optionally your karma. Mm -hmm. The legacies, rather than sealing and unsealing, you just have primary and secondary. And it looks like the list is pretty much the same as in C20. I didn't see any that I didn't recognize. Is, is primary and secondary something that could flip in theory for some characters over time? In yeah, um, or is it... yeah, you definitely could. And with the setup, you know, you mm -hmm. could end up with two unsealy legacies, for example. Mm -hmm. That'd be an interesting character. Gasp. I don't think I don't think they're very different. I mean, I, I kind of reworded a couple mm -hmm. of ones like Savage, which otherwise didn't age too well. But yeah, otherwise, mm -hmm. they're pretty much the same. Mm hmm. So for attributes and abilities, you have it that rather than the primary, secondary, tertiary, it's just, here's the dots, distribute them as you will, which is something that I know people have done at their table at mm -hmm. various points. Mm -hmm. So was there a particular reason you chose to set it up like that? Was it just for ease? Yeah, um, it was also the way that my tables did it. And mm -hmm. yeah, I did just want to present that as, as a, I mean, in the rules, it, it does say you can do 953. Is that what it is? 753? Seven five. Seven five <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I said y you could, but you know it is also just fifteen dots. Okay. Then backgrounds, you get five dots as usual with the common ones of allies, contact, mentor, resources, status, and then the special ones of freehold, legendary, remembrance, and treasure. And legendary is like title, but not. Yeah. That is correct. So because there are some subsystems, especially when we get into the un unhallowed incarnations that deal with giving people basically a rank or a title. But, you know, un unless you're talking about pre-World War II Japan, like they don't have titles like Count or Duke. So right. I wanted to, to make it into a background that would reflect that sort of thing, but not be culturally bound. Got it. Mm -hmm. There are examples which are really a nice touch. Like for each level, you have a, a sample that you can just kind of throw into a game. I would say the thing that took the most time toward the end of this book when, you know, when I was finishing up the writing was realizing that everything as much as possible needed a solid example for people to kind of hang their hat on. So I hope that mm. I did that. Then you choose forms. Mm -hmm. So can you explain a little bit about this three-way distinction that we get between wisdom, wonder, and wrath? Yes, this one was fun. I, uh, I hope I don't make anyone mad by saying I don't really like the realms. <laughs> <laughs> But basically, I thought, okay, um, if I get to make this thing from scratch, what am I going to do? And, and I also was thinking, again, like a unified theory of changeling. Okay, so the denizens of the dreaming have their three aria. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that and I thought, okay, there's something here. There's something that I could use for this. I thought, okay, each aria, for those who don't know the denizens, they have, instead of regular legacies, they have three separate forms of being. One that is kind of intellectual, one that is kind of wrathful. And then the other that's, uh, I guess, kind of human-ish. It's hard to describe. Mm -hmm. But I saw that and I thought, okay, all right, so the wrath one's very easy to, to figure out. And that's that's also in line with mythology, right? Most gods have a wrathful aspect. <laughs> um, and then they, they have the non-wrathful aspect, right? And I thought, okay, well, there's there's got to be more to that part, um, which is how I split it up into wisdom, which is, you know, the protecting, healing, oracle type stuff and then wonder which is the crazy mythological stuff that we read about in the stories so that's how it came to be right on. yeah and these are not just realms though they're also like epiphanies kind of yeah so i'm sorry yeah i should have made that clear so they replace the realm system in the magic which we'll get into but it's also the forms they they are what the gods are each god has a wise wondrous and wrathful aspect in, in terms of play, that's kind of a role-playing thing, but you use it to listen to certain kinds of prayers. Mm -hmm. So if you're a high wrath God, you're going to hear a lot of prayers asking, please get this guy, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're a, a high wonder God, you're going to hear a lot of people saying, please make me a movie star. And you kind of follow that and hook yourself up to certain prayers depending on your forms. So after forms, we get arts. And I think arts we should probably save for next chapter because that's where we go in depth. Yes. But these are different arts, but kind yeah. of like arts. In the magic. Mm -hmm. You still get three dots. Uh, and then tempers, where we have willpower equals the highest form rating, glamour four, devilement three, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And each of them, I mean, kind of like the C20 character creation, we have kind of some sample systems for how these change, how you get more, how you lose it, how you spend it. Mm -hmm. Defilement also seems to have a little bit of like a paradox vibe where if you bring on the mists, like if you do something magical that causes mortals to notice, that creates defilement. Yes. Um, And there's a reason for that. Oh, two reasons for that. One is I want to keep an urban fantasy vibe, right? That can't happen Mm -hmm. if you're throwing magic all over the place. So that's kind of the design reason. But the second reason is I feel if you are a god who is throwing magic all over the place and you know you haven't enchanted the people, so they're not going to remember why things have happened the way that they do, that's a very cruel thing to do to someone. Hmm. And so naturally, that's why I think blatant magic that's kind of reckless and that forces the mist to erase people's memory, that will accrue defilement. Like if you turn someone into a baguette that trips people. <laughs> <laughs> that, was just, that was one of my favorite examples in the book. Oh, right. The, the fairy tale idea. cannibalism. Yeah, we can get into that. Yeah. You also have uh, the lesser birthrights here, which might be worth pointing out. So the kinships, all of them start with a defined greater birthright, but then the little birthrights are like this list of powers that kind of do different things, which you have the option to pick from. Yes. I really wanted to make a build your own kit system. I knew that from the start. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I was flipping through C20 and all the old books and trying to like figure out, okay, what are the common threads of these of these birthrights? And I'm like, oh, oh no, they're, <laughs> it's, it's really hard, you know? So I thought, okay, so I have to build it to be equivalent in power, but consistent. And that's how I made that distinction. You're going to have the greater birthright that defines your kinship. If you're an Apsara, you are always going to be able to fly. That's just it. Mm -hmm. Um, But then the lesser birthrights, I wanted to give a little bit of customizability, but also, but have it represent those, like those little things, those little second birthrights that you'd get in Changeling. Mm -hmm. Like Slua, you know, they, they can squirm and stuff and they can talk to ghosts, but they also just have sharp senses in general. So I wanted to be able to represent that in the lesser birthrights. Okay, so then... The piece that I think I was happiest to see in this entire book was a system for prayers. Because in Land of Eight Million Dreams, we get all this scuttlebutt about how they go around answering prayers and not a single mechanical piece about how they really do it. So this was wonderful. (laughs) That's good. Um, Yeah, yeah. No, I tried to make a simple system that basically replaces Epiphany with something that can be kind of scalable. So I hope I did that. It's kind of like Epiphany through a Gase or through an Oath, like a Dark Ages Fae style Oath almost, which is interesting. And yeah, it is very customizable and personalizable. Yeah, this, this is what made me realize um, you could totally backdoor demon, a new demon <laughs> fallen into this. Speaking of prayers, I, uh, I want to go back to that question about how much the prior Kindred of the East book influenced this. Hmm. One important element was toward the end of the Kindred of the East book, I had to write the sections on how they interact with all the different realms of the spirit world. And like I said, I, I, I conceived of it all as, you know, each realm is part of a great cycle of reincarnation. And in there, when I described heaven as the dreaming, I just happened to give it an epithet and I made it up. I called it the realm of living prayers. And somebody said, that's beautiful. You should use that all the time. Ah, uh, oh, huh. That really, that really spoke to somebody. And so I held on to that. When I did this book, uh, Gods and Dreams, it kind of informed the ethos of like, a dream is a prayer, a prayer is a dream. They're not that different. Mm -hmm. There's also some nifty mechanics around how you hear all the prayers kind of within a range and of an intensity determined by your form. So like the stronger you get, the more prayers you hear and the more you can intuit where they are. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, That is probably a big sensory difference if you're playing changeling, classic changeling versus this, which is that it's assumed that the little gods are always hearing the prayers of people, of animals, of things all around them all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's not uncomfortable to them the way it would be to us. If they don't hear it, they're freaked out. Yeah. 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 And you also say, like, it doesn't even have to be of mortals or animals. Like, it can be of other gods. Like, you have this whole section yes. on oaths, and you're saying, yep, this is just prayers. <laughs> yes. It's your kinds of prayers, oaths. It also provides you some built in motivations for forming circles, which is kind of the motley equivalent, I suppose, or the oath circle equivalent, yes. maybe. And we get some mm-hmm. examples of those later on. But that's very good because then it's like, oh, yeah, we're all together, even though we're from disparate kinships and whatever. 
we're joining together to answer X kind of prayer. Yeah. So the point of this podcast right, is to give some people some inside dirt. Um, so let me do that. <laughs> um, it's to inspire and in- inform. Oh, sure. Yeah. Guess. But, you know, got to um, give people exciting content, too. Well, yeah. So the reason I call them circles is it's kind of a basic reason, which is that in the anime and manga world, when people come to come together to make like fan fiction, fan art, comics and things like that, um, they're called circles. And it's also the name for like, if you're in a college club, they call them circles. Mm. So I wanted to give that feeling to the little gods that they're kind of like they're fans of human life. They get together into these circles because like if you if you're dealing with a prayer that's like level four, level five, it's you one person cannot possibly do all this. Yeah. Um, but also because it's fun. They're having fun. Right on. Yeah. We wrap up with freebie points and merits and flaws. And then we get some kinship customization, which features the kappa, which are wonderful. Yeah. Glad to see them as the example. So. Oh, man. I was so lucky to. I, I don't remember what book this came from, but it was like, you know, I was. I was Dreams, and, Dreams nightmares. and nightmares. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my gosh, they actually do a kappa. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that was the like the one changeling book that was like, yeah, let's just include the entire world. Yeah. And you're like, uh, OK, and then, at least up until that point. And then it's like, oh, the dreaming's for Asia, but not the Fae. So I'm glad you got it. And I feel like that's the one we point to the most as a kith that are not changelings and, and changeling the dreaming. Like yeah. they, are, they are an entire culture and society and family. They just don't have bodies. But mm-hmm. there are some rules for experience where there are actually some risks to having high glamour in the sense of yeah. As you go past five, you have to like maintain more and more prayers or you gain defilement. Yeah, that's true. That, that kind of made me feel like changing the lost. That was lost, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, with, with lost, like as your weird trait gets higher, you become more and more like the ones who abducted you and it yeah. gets uncomfortable. Ah, I see, I see. Yeah, um, I wanted the feeling of, I call it divine alchemy when they create an incarnation. And so... Mm-hmm. I didn't want to punish people for having high traits too much, but like I wanted there to be that sense of you do need to keep in mind your balance. Well, and duty as well. I yeah. mean, that that idea of with great power comes great responsibility, which is something that players often forget <laughs> or don't want to think <laughs> which about. Which is fine, yeah. But, but I like seeing it. Yeah. There's notes on the curse that you get as your defilement goes up, which, oh no, this is like different kinds of undoing. That's what. Basically, yeah, mm. basically. Yeah, I like there's actually system. C20 doesn't have a system for undoing. It just says it does. I noticed that, yeah. And Echoes, some classic examples of folkloric banes and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Now we're at chapter four, arts. Yes. So I think I said this on the Land of Eight Million Dreams recording, but despite the fact that the magic system is entirely disaligned from Changeling, it is, I think, probably the most interesting part of that book and really establishes it as potentially being its own game. I do feel these are equally distinct and interesting, and Mm -hmm. I like it. Thank you. I mean, it is based on the same. It's a little different, but yeah, yeah. I took a lot of inspiration from Land of Eight. Yeah, with the sort of, you have these different categories, and it's like increasing difficulty in the the generic sense of, feels a little bit magey, but flavorful, I guess. So the basics that we get here are that each art has a worldly and a subtle element. They can be used through weavings, which are like cantrips-ish, or maybe more like rotes than mage or unleashing, and that access to an art grants access to all of the powers, but they differ in intensity, which needs more glamour, and Mm -hmm. the number of successes you need are adjusted by modifiers, and fortunes not successes that the, reduces glamour yeah that's right uh and that's yeah it. so modifiers and intensity all together create the the total glamour cost got it yeah. okay yeah. we have a sidebar on the theory of bunks with like yeah fortunes versus kithane bunks and how it's hmm which one's right and maybe yeah. both are different approaches same thing and i really love how the forms inform the kind of um well the dice pools that you get for doing different kinds of magic i thought that was an mm-hmm. elegant touch thank you thank you yeah it, it gives the benefits of the one e changeling without the really weirdness of the one e changeling. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah as far as the the bunk and fortune difference goes i did feel that i had to address the fact that it's the, the actions that can make magic easier are so differently presented in c20 
but I didn't want to bar people from it. You know, like say like, oh no, you you absolutely cannot burp to make your magic easier to cast. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> instead, you know, just try to say like, well, both of these things are true, but what the real mechanism is, people are disagreeing over. Mm, I'm into that. So then for the intensities that we get, these, if I'm remembering correctly, are drawn from 8 million dreams, right? Like awaken element, command element, create, transform, enlighten. More or less. Yeah, more or less. I had to make some adjustments. Yes. Only some? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I loved the idea. Uh, again, I loved ideas. The The idea of the Wutan and the way that it's structured. Ah, oh, beautiful. Looks so good on paper. Mm -hmm. But I think your colleague on the, the Land of Eight Million Dreams podcast has mentioned, like, it's kind of interesting that you can't actually model a lot of folkloric Asian stuff yeah. with, with these powers. Um, it's a really cool elemental system, that's for sure. Um, I feel like this is another little piece of Mabilla set. <laughs> with the, it feels a little bit like domain oh, yeah, level, yeah. Actually, level things. Yes, yeah. let, me be, let me be open about that. While I was putting this together, I thought like, okay, so like dot levels are going to mean this. Just like in Changeling, I'm going to make it the way that people expect. And then, yeah, it was like the spirit of Jenna Moran just kind of <laughs> popped over my shoulder and said like, you could do it this way instead. So that's why, yeah, like instead, if, you, if you're used to the discipline sphere sort of or, or, you know, Changeling art way of doing powers, this might take a little bit of getting used to. It's, it's a good way of sort of, if you want to make new arts it could be kind of clear like how to do the intensities for them then like oh sure yeah that's sort of that's where the what nobilis does with it every character creates their own power yeah like player character so this is handy as like a framework on the q a threads there are people actually trying to make their own arts and they're like what do you think and i tell them well it seems okay so yeah mm -hmm. it's it's making people feel creative and i'm happy about that and the idea of making arts, it feels a lot more straightforward with this system. Like you do provide mm -hmm. guidelines for it, but it does seem easier to do that than creating one for the yeah. Changeling base game. Yeah, much like the kiths, you don't have to make your own kith. You don't have to make your own art, but it's structured in a way that's a lot clear, more clear how to yeah. do it if you want to. Oh, I'm so glad that comes through. <laughs> yep. So I don't think we need to go through every weaving but mm -hmm. they are useful yeah. examples of how to build effects using the arts. Some of which, again, I, I assume some were adapted from 8 Million Dreams. Some of them remind me of Exalted Charms. But each has modifier examples and some cool notes. So they are really helpful for getting a sense of like how these things shake out and play. The one that started it all. Because, you know, if you looked at earlier pages of, of the live drafting thread, I was kind of struggling with how to do this. Um, and I tried this, like I did this like free form magic, uh, sphere like system. And I thought, Oh no, this is, this is not good. Yeah. And after, you know, kind of meditating, letting it percolate for a while, I thought, okay, I think I can do it like this. And I wrote what ended up being the delightful maidens of nightshade, the level five power for blossoms. So that is the origin point of how these weavings started to be put together. I feel like there's pieces here that could help if you don't like the sphere system in Mage and want to. <laughs> sure. Maybe not exactly this. I wouldn't use this exactly as is for that, but I think it could be a good inspiration for how to do it a bit differently. Yeah. And there's also lots of systems around the arts. I mean, we get stuff about uh, using willpower to resist magic, how to do counter magic, that piece again of like the defilement of forcing the unenchanted to interact with magic. Like all of that, it's the packaging around the powers themselves that sometimes I wish mm -hmm. Mage had more of. Yeah, I, I like this sidebar, that old fairy tale cannibalism, because that was actually a problem I had the one time I ran Dark Ages Fae, yep. where the player characters <laughs> were just using I can't which power it is, like tran the transformation thing on everyone. And like there was like this big bad NPC, and they like turned her into a stag in like one turn and then ate her. And I'm like, wow, it's right here it's, it's like a little bit broken <laughs> it's addressing that <laughs> yeah yeah it's um it's folkloric i know yeah i was i was yeah. writing the, the the weaving right next to it mortal transmutation yeah. and yeah it's like there was a demon on my back saying like you could turn people into a steak and eat them and I was yeah. like, oh, but no. the fact that this exact example this? happened in a game <laughs> of dark ages fade that i ran and then it addresses yeah. both the more defilement implications but also would not be ne as nearly as easy to just pull off on a yeah. <laughs> another. Yeah, I, I do want to bring up, there was something that I developed 
from the Relentless Age, the earlier book, that kind of carried over here, which is when I'm designing the powers, generally speaking, your average mortal stands no chance. Mm -hmm. They don't get an opportunity to fight back. That changes if they're important to the story. Mm -hmm. So that does put a little bit of impetus on the storyteller to decide. Yeah. Um, but I kind of, I wanted that distinction. Well, in, in Relentless Age, it was clear because the Hungry Dead are supposed to be unstoppable monsters. Mm-hmm. But it also carries here, because just because I wanted people to feel powerful, you know, if you want to ensorcel and confuse some random security guard, you know, go for it. You shouldn't have to do a bunch of contested roles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you don't have it where, like Dark Jesus Fae, where even if you're another Fae, you still can't resist it. <laughs> and it gets exactly. who won yeah. initiative. It is actually, it's yeah. pretty hard to affect someone directly if they are another mm-hmm. little god. Yeah. So the arts we get are beasts, blossoms, embers, metal, shadows, stones, tempests, and waves. There's also rules for cohort effects and grand weavings, which are respectively using more than one art at a time or working with a group. Mm -hmm. And then the art creation tools where we get roads as a ninth art example. So the the cohort effects and grand weavings, that's something I love in a magic system and so many magic systems don't have it that need it. So it's great that this has that. (laughs) I just want to say that. Oh, and the sidebar about the process of learning arts and character, I really enjoyed as well. Mm-hmm. That was a that was a late edition. Oh. Um, with my friend Coco, with with her help, I I finished laying out this chapter, and I thought, okay, that's it, that's done. Let's just put let's put a little piece of art right here. And I realized, I said, how do you learn a weaving? Who teaches mm-hmm. a weaving? What what does that feel like? You know? Mm-hmm. And, oh crap! I have to write a sidebar. So that's how it came together. Yeah, I like that you address it, but you don't turn it into like, well, for this level, you yeah. must have a teacher, which will cut down the <laughs> training requirement. <laughs> yeah. But especially like the fact that you can have it be a training montage. Like, yeah, that's great. So then chapter five, storytelling divided into sections named after the forms. So wisdom first, we get some guidance for running a game of modern fantasy. And there's some notes about including bygones and the living prayers with the overt, they are real kind of statement. And yeah, here's where the greater remembrance thing is with each dot being a past life, which I love. But I wanted to, Josh knows that I like to harp about themes and moods. And in particular with this book, I'm curious kind of like, what's the range of stories that you expect people to tell using this book? There's a little bit of it addressed here, but I wonder if you maybe... How do you think a game will look to the players? Okay, um, let me ask you something. If we're talking range, what is the lower range and what is the upper range? Mm, Lower range would be I can only see one possible kind of game to play with this book, which is not the case. I see lots of possibilities, Uh, but I don't know how many readers will see that. Oh, I see. I see. Oh, okay. You you mean in term in terms of potential stories? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Not so much a, a range of. So obviously, you should be able to model some kind of modern day journey to the West, complete with people who want to eat you. I have systems <laughs> for that. Uh, you know, you should be able to model Sailor Moon. I do mention that. You could do slice of life stuff like um, well, there's a newer anime called Call of the Night. You can you can do just kind of chilling at nighttime kind of stuff. And it's weirded away, obviously. Yeah, spirited away. Yeah, that that you could do that. Though it'd probably be a little bit more integrated with the mortal world, ideally. Um, but yeah, you could definitely do a crazy bathhouse in the dreaming. And yeah, I mean, and you can even do things that are kind of reminiscent of Exalted. In that is, you know, there is a certain level of secrecy, but within that that layer of secrecy, you could take over the world. So yeah, like also another one with the prayer aspect, something that Changeling says but doesn't really have systems that this does more have is like nurturing a community. Hmm. Like oh, that yeah. seems like a weirdly, I would say one of the key core changeling stories that I don't see working very easily here, and I, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing, is like mm-hmm. the high noble court drama kind of intrigue stuff. You could do other kinds of intrigue, but because there doesn't really seem to be the same structure of like outright noble versus commoner, it kind of doesn't have as much weight. Like you could still have mm. nobility, but it's not like the defining feature of the society. It doesn't. It doesn't seem like it's on the brink of civil war. I guess would be. Yeah. that's true. When we were talking about the kinships, I do want to make clear. So I, I compare the celestials to kind of the autumn sheep, but there's also a subcategory of the celestials that I, you know, I say they could be called Arcadians to the east. I would call them Lunarians because uh, they're very moon themed. But they do have these invaders who came 1969 and later, 
mm. who have that bearing, who have that kind of, uh, I guess I'll call it psychopathic nobility vibe <laughs> to them. So it's possible on a small scale. Okay. For a large scale, you'd have to you'd have to build it. I think that's 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 what I'd say. That works. Then under wonder, we get some more advanced mechanics. Augman, I'm obviously into that at the level of freehold and then the different layers of the lower heavens, the dreaming, and some example grotto heavens, which are like dream realms, sure. and then rules for traveling through dreams. So again, other things from Land of Eight Million Dreams that I think have been addressed and rectified here are the relationship with the dreaming in the sense that even though the old version of this young could go to the dreaming, they didn't really care about it much. Right Here it seems like I'll turn this into a question. How do you see their relationship with the dreaming or with the lower heavens? It's exactly the way that the Cathayne are in, in C20. To the Celestials, it's their homeland. To groups that are more like the Earth-blooded, you know, they see it as also their homeland, but really their homeland is Earth. But yeah, they, they, all of them have a deep connection to it. You know, they'll have, they have reasons to go there. Hmm. I, don't, I do want to say I like your advanced rules versus optional rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it seems like the advanced rules are if you want to expand upon this part of the game, and the optional rules are if you want to change an aspect of the game. That's true. Yeah. Uh, and then for more optional rules under Wrath, we just have if you want to make the magic as bonkers as it was in Land of Eight Million Dreams, yeah. here you go. Yeah. Yeah. I just had someone ask because, you know, here I say, you know, the, the problem with Land of Eight Million Dreams was that there was no limit on fortunes. I, I triple-checked yeah. that that book. You know, if you have like a crazy festival fortune thing that you do all sorts of colors and statues and incense, uh, you know, you could make it rain frogs all over Tokyo or something. And somebody in the RPGNet Q&A thread asked, you know, like, what if I did take away um, <laughs> the fortune? And I said, I just told you, please don't do that. Um, yeah. But you, you could, you could, but it would turn into Exalted or, or Noblest. Akira. Oh my god, yeah. yes. <laughs> at, at the worst case, yeah. I guess you could have like a scary NPC that can too. Mm. <laughs> that's a thing. Yeah, Some that's reason. true. I, I can only imagine, you know, players are so creative. They're so creative. Mm -hmm. And if you don't give some reasonable restrictions, oh man, things can get crazy. <laughs> oh boy. And then we get the C20 conversion guide, yes. which you sort of present like... In my own game, I feel like I'm going to mix and match from this bit if I'm using from using this. Like parts of it, you know, I'm like this is this is exciting. I could have like SN PCs in a game that has also Kithane PCs, right? But I think I'd mix and match this, so like have some bits keeping from this book and some books with C20, if that makes sense. But I mean, you can look at that. It's all these different optional rules, but yeah, I really tried to. Um address the like i said there were there were mm -hmm. people who were not super happy that i was kind of reinventing the wheel here mm -hmm. so i really tried to look deeply at the c20 systems and make some make a conversion guide that was you know excuse the language but not bullshit and yep. you know would, would really address their concerns and make something c20 compliant so i hope that worked yeah i mean i think it all yep. it all hangs together and, and i would say like the echoes conversion rule even if you're running regular vanilla c20 maybe look to bring something like that in just so you can actually have rules for forgetting we're being undone hey. <laughs> so then uh chapter six yes mm -hmm. i think this one we might just have to very quickly <laughs> talk about there's so much it yeah, is so, so much. much it is a world tour special shout out for the note about slua being russian in the opening fiction <laughs> so yes the first part of this chapter is kinships from different countries around the region with some example uh, example kits. I did a quick count. So we have one from Burma, one from Cambodia, four from China, four from India, one from Indonesia, six from Japan, five from Korea, one from Laos, one from Nepal, two from the Philippines, two from Singapore, two from Thailand, and one from Vietnam for 31 total. We often talk about kiss bloat in Changeling, but I don't think this is kiss bloat because there could be thousands, like thousands upon thousands, if we really tried to do a full accounting. So I think 31 seems very reasonable. Yeah. And I just want to, I don't think we had like this. Congratulations being one of the few World of Darkness books that like actually talks about India as being. A well, and, and Southeast <laughs> Asia in particular, like as much yeah. as India could use a lot more, Southeast Asia is like a complete blank spot in the entire you know, series. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that's 
you know, it's funny, the more we talk, the more I realize I have more to say that as far as design goals go, um, in terms of making setting stuff, I felt like India got a lot of short shrift. Maybe, I don't know, writers at the time might have been afraid to go, you know, too deep into it because it is a huge culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then I felt like Southeast Asia. Oh, boy, where do you even begin there? The original. This is the one time that I'll that I I think I'll be unkind um, to the original work, because for the most part, I really try to be understanding 1998 low tech, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, things as far as cultural sensitivity weren't quite where they are today. Right. But. The Southeast Asia stuff is is uh, terrible. It's awful. It's mm-hmm. offensive. Like, I think in Kindred of the East, they actually use a, a header. They call like Bangkok a, a hive of scum and villainy. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. I have to wonder, given that we're largely talking about Gen X Americans, if it was like Vietnam War stuff in the back of their minds, but yeah. Oh, it totally was. That's, that's all you get in Vietnam mm-hmm. references a lot of the time. I mean, of course... I, I should do the caveat, you know, later books in the year, like Kinder of the East and stuff like that, they they did try to course correct. But that's why the, the mm-hmm. big goal was for me to, you know, like Southeast Asia is not a criminal wonderland. Yeah. It's a normal place. <laughs> but even when they didn't do that, they then presented Southeast Asia as the weird hodgepodge of China and Japan right, with different yeah. words, which was like well, awesome. that was, Do you remember I had like a breakdown about the geography in that one chapter where it was like, oh, oh yeah, here's... Here's this empire which contains like Mongolia and Cambodia, and that does not work. <laughs> no. <laughs> ah, anyway, um, it's like you didn't look at an atlas. So this, you... this was a breath of fresh air, is my yep. takeaway. I'm glad. I will say, you know, like as far as cultural stuff goes, like it, it was easy to talk about mythologies because you can look those up, you can check them. I give the example of the Dokebi kind of changing over time as mm. things are reevaluated, but for the most part, it's not that hard. I did try to tread carefully because, like you said, like Southeast Asia, like Vietnamese have beef with Chinese and Cambodians have beef with Vietnamese, and like that kind of stuff. I just tried to avoid that altogether. So, did that play into your process for deciding which of these kinships to actually include? I tried. So, actually, when I, when I made this list. As much as possible, I tried to include stuff that was, one, interesting and not, not too problematic to include. But also, I wanted to include examples that could be built into other things if people wanted to. So like mm-hmm. the very first one, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm saying the Burmese right, but the, the Manusia, they, yes, they are a particular Burmese thing, but they are also a good model for a kinship that's created by mortal sorcerers for example. Hmm. So I tried to keep that in mind. But yeah, I I guess I did try to avoid landmines, but that was kind of more of a subconscious thing more than a conscious decision about what to include. Mm -hmm. So the second part of the chapter is example prayers. I, I think I earlier said the magic was my favorite part. This is actually my favorite part of the book because I think this encapsulates everything about the text into like bite sized story stuff that you can deploy immediately. Structurally, what we get is a few paragraphs that kind of outline a story-sized setting, the circle of little gods that would potentially be involved in it, and the prayer that they are working with. So for example, like there's one in India where you have to deal with a cursed village, or there's one in Korea where you have to keep a functioning government going for ghosts. I think my favorite was probably the yokai market in Japan, because I'm a big fan of the yokai, but... Yeah, so these, I think there's like 10 total. These are really elegantly done, and I applaud this. Thank you. Thank you for uh, coming to my um, TED Talk. <laughs> yeah, two, two of them are actually in the U.S. Yes, so which I found with a major Metaplot yeah. off-ramp in the first one. Yeah, yeah. I, I only wish that I could have written more. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I tried to, tried to make them as interesting as I could. Yeah. Well, these kind of things could... Uh, you don't want to make follow-ups so these are the yeah. perfect things for that kind of thing mm. yeah so then the last one is a system for rhapsody which is pretty interesting why i can think of answers but why <laughs> why use the bring in that one epiphany i guess is rhapsody so i felt that most of the other forms of epiphany um were covered by the prayer system mm-hmm. with the exception of two right so rhapsody is here 
ravaging, I've actually made into a defiled technique, which is in chapter seven. Mm -hmm. Because those two, they're kind of unabashedly harmful in a way. So yeah, that's I separated those out for that reason. Well, as a card carrying member of House Leona and I approve. <laughs> so yeah, it's it's a ginormous chapter with a lot of really great options and hooks and stuff. But speaking of really great chapters with a lot of options and hooks and stuff, then there's chapter seven. Yep. I keep saying this thing is my favorite, but this one might be my favorite. Yeah. And tags to Rachel. Well, first of all, you have enchantment. And uh, I like this way better than the C20 enchantment yeah. rules. In fact, I might like it better than the pre-C20 enchantment rules. <gasps> but it's heavily similar. Yeah, so you have enchantment, which uses the token system. And then you have degrees of canane, which include of mortal merits. So was there a particular... I really liked how you can almost have like canane by association in the sense that if you're connected with one of the little gods it makes you easier to enchant not oh, necessarily yeah. because you have any kind of like familial relationship but just your bestie yes a derogatory way of putting it it would be probably like those uh those anime uh, girl falling from a, from the sky kind of <laughs> stories but what i mean by that is you know i i wanted to make sure that that you could model stories where you you're just a normal person and some crazy divine stuff just happens to happen and your life has changed. Yeah. Do you have a, here's a controversial question you might not have thought of. We can get it. Um, using these for other supernatural <laughs> things in a crossover game. Do you think you some mean, of these could like, work or uh, like a vampire God touched or something like that? Or werewolf or mage or yeah. Oh sure. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. With the exception of the hungry dead and half devils, Everybody else needs to be enchanted anyway. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you totally could make them God-touched. Mm -hmm. We get a section on the Harvesters, who I think are my favorite new enemy in this entire thing. Oh, I'm so glad. No, honestly, like they, these are villains I've been waiting for to exist. Yeah. Consuming pieces of the Fae to gain power. Yes. Yeah, so um, I guess I can talk about this one too, a little bit more in depth. Since you like it, and I know a lot of other people like it, um, and I'm really, mm -hmm. really grateful for that. So what happened was, as I was writing kinships and stuff like that, I would keep referencing, in, in a way to try to call back to Land of Eight Million Dreams, because the Land of Eight Million Dreams, they were always afraid of other monsters, right? Like, mm -hmm. these guys are going to eat us, they're going to kill us, right? And so I would I would say something like, uh, in the in the Chilin, for example, I'd say like, oh, the Chilin are kind of wary of mortal sorcerers, you know, chopping them up for parts or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then someone on the live thread um, at the time said, you know, you you mentioned them using them for parts and harvesting them a lot. Are you going to have <laughs> systems for this? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh. I am now. Yes. <laughs> I, I feel like this also fills in a place in some of, especially the earlier Changeling books, where writers got confused by Dante and Autumn people and thought they were basically harvesters, yes. <laughs> even though that concept didn't exist as a written thing. So it's like, there you go. Some of those NPCs from earlier books, here you go. Here's rules for them now. <laughs> yeah. And it also, I mean, it is also mythologically, or I'm sorry, folklorically, I guess, accurate mm -hmm. uh, for this setting because everybody wanted to eat the Monkey King. So that's, that's all what came into it, yeah. Yeah. It also fits the, like, when they describe change to describe mages as doing stuff and like mage doesn't have any reason that they do this but again these guys would so it's well there's nothing that says in mage you can't have consume fey as your instrument for yep but yes i will absolutely be introducing these into a game yeah this is this is even if you're not using this space system and you're not running with the sand in your game really this is the kind of thing in this book but there's a few things like this that would still be you definitely want to look at yeah so then we get some rules for becoming gone blooded. If not through luck, it takes a ritual and some treasures or trophies to awaken the spark of divinity. And if you start answering prayers, maybe you'll ascend to little god status in your next incarnation or something. Yeah. This is another thing which I think is a great addition to the game, but I think it wouldn't port easily in its entirety like this into C20. And I wonder if I have mm -hmm. that feeling because in sort of the metaphysical ideas that are foundational in Western culture, reincarnation is like so much less present or less visible than it is. Although it's there. It's still, there, so. but it's it's just yeah. not foregrounded in the same way. But I can yeah. see this as being like a template to overlay on kiths, or maybe this is how like new kiths get created from urban <sighs> legends about people, things like that. 
Right, that joke supplement I keep that saying the houses of Tremere, where it's just House Tremere in each different splat. There you this go. could be how you could get House Tremere. <laughs> they did this instead of vampires. Do you want Tremere? Because that's how you get Tremere. Yep. Yeah. Um, this particular section, it was created for two reasons. One, kind of, again, folklorically, to, to model that uh, cultivation type of fantasy where through discipline and hard work, you can become immortal. But the other reason was because I had made the immortal sages as a, as a major kinship. <laughs> and the inevitable question was, how do you become one? Yeah. So that, you can, that was, yeah. You can become one. Yeah, exactly. We get more on defilement. And here we have the sort of one through 10 stages. And it's much more apparent how much cruelty and corruption are involved in defilement rather than just like the apathy of mm-hmm. banality. But there is a change where the defilement seems to start triggering the little gods at five, which feels low. And I wondered why Why that um, is. You mean they start suffering from curses at five? Or do you mean... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or the, the dramatic interaction triggers a role of permanent defilement. That's it. Oh, yeah. So the reason why I wanted there to be some bite, but not too much, simply put. All right. So once you get to defilement seven, eight... That's when you roll and you get a number of points for each success. That can be pretty devastating, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I wanted there to be like, you know, once once there's a defilement, defilement five, something's wrong with this person. Something is a little mm-hmm. off. And it will take actually talking to them and kind of getting to know their damage. And it only risks really one point, two points if you're unlucky from that scene, mm-hmm. right? That was the, I wanted there to be a consequence to show that even at this level, somebody can potentially be dangerous, but not have it be so much that people are too afraid of them. So this could, could this apply to mortals defilement? Yeah. Yes. yes. Everybody has defilement. Okay. Okay. Level six is a nurse. Those examples, uh, they are all examples of people who make me very upset. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I have to say, I personally, I still love banality as a sinner. But anyway, well, (laughs) that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. But I have a question about defilement for reincarnation. Like, is there a point where it stops? Like, it says there's a point of no return and like at nine or 10, like in a previous life, is there sort of like a point that they could have fallen to defilement and it kind of got reset versus? Oh, I see. I mean, I don't go into the mechanics of, of people being reborn. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of, a, you can kind of assume that if someone is at defilement eight or nine, they're going to go to the thousand hells, most likely. Okay. Womp womp. Yeah, they're they're too weighed down by what you, I guess you'd call it negative mm-hmm. karma. Once you get to 10, that's beyond and you could potentially become the equivalent of Dante, even if you're mortal. Mm-hmm. So we get defiled objects as well. And I quite like the note that it's intention and the sort of embedded compulsive desire that matters, not the material necessarily, but what it represents. Yeah, I wanted to make sure that I talked about this one because I knew that it could potentially be controversial. Mm. When you talk about changeling, it's, um, you know, what's cold iron? Is it meteoric iron? Is it cold Mm -hmm. pounded iron with no heat? You know? I'm sure you remember those debates. Oh, they still yeah, they're still going on. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> oh my gosh! Uh, but yeah, so I, I try to sidestep that all together because one, you know, iron doesn't quite have the same mythological oomph mm-hmm. in most Eastern cultures that it does here. But I didn't want it to be as simple as oh, instead of iron, they're weak to jade. You know? Um, right. Yeah, that was but, that felt silly. <laughs> yeah. So instead, you know, I, I, I wanted to integrate it into the system, which is you know, defilement is. Mm-hmm. Defilement is the end of everything. So you kind of create these, uh, I guess you call them evil treasures with defilement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it works. So then we get the unhallowed, who are Dante equivalents. Yeah. And these make more sense in the structure of defilement Mm -hmm. as a thing in the setting than the Dante and C20, where it felt weird to me. Yeah. 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 Well, and that's what's so infuriating is that, because as I read through this, I keep looking for you know, if I don't want to run this game wholesale as it is from this book, Mm -hmm. what are the aspects that I could still bring into the games that I run? And this is really difficult because the way C20 has revised Dante, it's so divergent from what it was. Mm -hmm. I like these. (laughs) Yeah, I had to deal with the because I, you know, I, I read my old copy of Autumn People. And then I looked at C20. And I did see that difference. And it was a little bit hard. I, I, I knew I wanted something like that. Fae who are overcome with defilement, you know, they don't die. They become something terrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, you know, thinking of like, um, like no face and spirited away, how he just gradually becomes mm-hmm. this, this 
awful creature. And I wanted to model that. So I kind of had to go back to the drawing board, go back to kind of the Buddhist concept of, of, of craving and how it's kind of the root mm-hmm. of suffering. Yeah. And, you know, these are just people who they don't care who they hurt. They just don't want to leave. Hmm. Yeah. We got some really interesting systems for how that shakes out as well. So you could conceivably run an entire game just kind of based around that. Oh, yeah. They're probably pretty hard to beat, but it's they're like a big bad if you meet a master, Datia. Well, and the, the idea of mastery being merging with a freehold and defiling it, that's like, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. And actually, the flawed mastery with yeah. <laughs> the, the, slaw, the bar fly, that was also kind of late, too. I was writing the systems, and I, I assumed, you know, you become Datia or Dante, and you, you can move around freely. And then I thought, oh, what if they get it wrong? What if they screw it up? That would make them even more angry. Like The Shining. Yeah, exactly. We then get, um, I, I mean, I love this chapter just because there are these unique monsters that fit so well into this book that I had never really like thought about how this would shake out before. But the Infernal Mysteries, which I almost kind of see like Dark Shirein, like they find immortality through alignment with the Goddess of Defilement. And then there's some Fomorian alignment in here. I was like, hmm, where have I seen those three colors before? Yeah. But yeah, like it kind of brings together all these threads in a really nice way where you have like that aspect of the hells, but then also like the Fomorian side and then also the immortality piece, the need for balance. Yeah, as far as designing these go, they came from the Curacao, one of the Moo courts in the Land mm. of Eight Million Dreams. I mean, I, I tried to ask people who, you know, have the linguistic skills. I could not figure out what the heck Curacao actually means. So I knew I had to, I had to dump it. And I went with the term Mara, which is a a term for kind of a Buddhist demon or affliction. So this is actually an interesting case where I I decided to be careful. So uh, for for the Dante equivalents, I call them Deitya, which is from the Mahabharata, the Hindu mythology. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that was okay. I don't think there are people worshiping the Deityas. So I, you know, if I'm if I'm wrong, someone can correct me and then I can I can change it. But yeah, I felt okay with Deitya. And then with Infernal Mysteries... The, the whole, the goddess of defilement, I, I wanted them to have sold their souls to hell, but they have a way out through this kind of transcendental process yes. of making themselves into the goddess of defilement. And uh, the term for that is actually Tantra yeah. from you know Tibetan Buddhism. And so I was, I was all geared up. I was like, I'm going to call this the infernal Tantra. It's going to be awesome. And then I thought like, no, that could potentially be very offensive. I need to not do that. Infernal mysteries. <laughs> there you go. So that's the sort of decision making that would happen. <laughs> but yeah. that's that's the process that I think other people should learn from. That I think is a yeah. good I think it also helps like just I mean this is written in English. Mysteries, infernal mysteries, like an English speaker with no knowledge of Buddhism or yeah or Hinduism or anything like that could read that and go, Yep, I know what that means. <laughs> Makes sense. It's true. And and as far as I know, no shrines to the Deityas, but many people actually do Tantra, so Mm -hmm. they decided not to go there well and interestingly the idea that one of the sort of rewards is being able to move through incarnations with ease and maintaining total continuity of mind and traits across bodies Mm -hmm. and in the next section enlightened alchemy which is much more good shihain in this case (laughs) you know they still have that balance and they need to have lower and lower defilement but ultimately the reward is the same thing the continuity through lifetimes so it's an interesting yeah. parallel. Yeah, with the the distinction being that Amara will just take one of their followers and hollow them out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, insert themselves like an avocado seed. Gross. So. <laughs> we finish up the appendix with magical creatures and systems for building them. Uh, there's a bunch of examples. My favorite is the Mouse Baron. Just brilliant. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a tithed one in here as well, which is very interesting. Yeah, I, I saw, you know, while I was doing some Storyteller's Vault research, I saw somebody had written up the Tithe Ones. Yes, um, Harbingers of Winter has them. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I wanted to make sure at least that I, I, I had a little bit of a distinct take. Hmm. So I hope that came through. Yeah. We get some non-bygone Storyteller characters, ranging from a mortal child all the way up to Archmaster of some kind. Mm-hmm. And then some sample player characters, my favorite name of which is Noriko Fuji, Lady of Glow Sticks and War. Uh, oh, yeah, she's my favorite, too. You also have this rank system that feels kind of like 
challenge level or something. Yeah, uh, but you know that's yeah, it works. No, it makes sense. Uh, oh, and here's where the half devil player character option is as well, and the half devil uh, magic rules as well. Yeah, they're simplified, mm-hmm. but I hope uh, people who want to use them uh, can get a lot of mileage out of them. Okay, so there were questions right to answer that came from your folks. Mm-hmm. I guess going back to the going back to the infernal mystery, somebody asked if you reincarnate in hell, can you get out without becoming a Mara? I guess the answer is yes, but it would probably be some kind of quest. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, you can't become a hungry dead little god. <laughs> oh, some kind of, uh, what, what are those called? The abominations? Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you kept that in here with the kindred of the East thing where they're like, that's what sort of the idea is. They're mortals that escape from hell. Right. And then yes. Like, well, yes that's but true. if you're a, <laughs> but I guess if you're dead as a little god, how does that re- work reincarnation wise? Like, is there a difference if your former life was a little god versus a mortal? Are you a ghost either way, or is it like a it's um, kind of ghost? I'm gonna say that it's kind of a hand wavy reincarnation <laughs> thing, because even yeah. even in real life religions that that deal in reincarnation, there's a question of if you have a ghost of someone, right? Mm-hmm. Are they reincarnated as a ghost? And therefore, they are not the same person and don't even have the mm-hmm. same memories. They just have the same, maybe the same appearance. Mm-hmm. Or do they continue on and they become a ghost the way that we that we in the West usually see it? So yeah. that question is very much up in the air, I think, also for, for little gods who are killed by a defiled object and they, quote unquote, reincarnate in hell. Yeah. What are they really? Can they be saved? Um, I'll leave that up to your storyteller. Nice. But oh, actually, maybe here's a question I missed. A little god who's just sort of dies a more less defily way. Mm-hmm. What what happens next? <laughs> maybe I'm a bit. Oh, um, if their anchor dies, they basically go back to the lower heavens. They are they are the unincarnated. Okay. They are um, essentially bygones at that point. Oh, okay, and then they could maybe inc- incarnate. Again. They have to wait for their turn. Yeah, exactly. they respawn. Yeah. But it's not the same yeah. as like you died in this life and you end up as a. You could potentially be an animal or you could potentially be a little god or whatever, like in some other region. Anyway. Well, there's a note at right. some point about yeah. you don't necessarily have to be a consistent incarnation from lifetime to lifetime, right? So you could potentially mm-hmm. re-anchor to a different thing. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, would you still be the same uh, kinship? Yes and no. So one of the conceits that I have is that the mortal world is the realm of endless change, right? It's mm-hmm. the realm of infinite possibility. And so the act of incarnation, of taking mortal form, you become different. The energy of change mm-hmm. will change you in some way. So over time, you know, that, that manifests as different, maybe different lesser birthrights from lifetime to lifetime. Mm-hmm. You know, you're revived in one incarnation and you have, you're really good with swords and then you are quickened in your next mm-hmm. incarnation and suddenly you can talk to cats. You know, these kinds of things will kind of, they'll kind of freak them out, you know, because mm-hmm. God's. They don't like the idea that they, they themselves are changing. But over time, yeah, they will. They are different. They're not the same mm-hmm. beings that they were. Actually, sir, here's another question I have, because, I mean, you've, you've taken rid of the chimerical versus mundane damage or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, like, the you're a by, what happens when a bygone dies? When a bygone dies, they're dead. Yeah. Then that's that's also the case if you are unincarnated. If you're, if you're a little mm-hmm. god who currently doesn't have an anchor and your real fairy soul is killed, you're dead. Uh, no, you don't reincarnate. As... I mean, you reincarnate in the, in the Buddhistic sense. You, you, yeah. Okay, so, so you could <laughs> you die as that and then you end up in... If you die. Anyway, okay, that yeah. makes sense. We've sorted out all the deaths. <laughs> yeah. But yes, there's a lot of really intriguing ideas in here and sort of a Xian perspective on a lot mm-hmm. of the elements of Changeling that weren't previously considered. So I appreciated that. I'm glad you liked it. Mm-hmm. I did. And then there's an appendix. Appendix Strange Cousins, which is depicting <laughs> the rest of Changeling. Some of the rest of Changeling. Well, some of the rest of Changeling, but using these rules. and kind Selected. Of, it's like, yeah, using these rules, you get some of the other kits. I had it in my mind that I would try to convert all of the main kit vein oh. kits. Uh, and then I thought, oh my god, this book is going to be 450 pages. I have well, to stop. <laughs> I think with your kit creation rules, if you just pull out the kit description you look at some of these examples you look at the kith creation rules i think you can figure it out pretty easily yeah. what they would i didn't do full reps for everybody but i did try to sneak some in like the the slew of barfly mm-hmm. example mm-hmm. i snuck in the she how they work i snuck in the pot of seams how they work so as much as i could 
The interesting thing at the very end is the take on the Thalane, and mm -hmm. this is a, a quite cool rehashing of them. In particular, the idea that in truth, the Thalane are not as old or alien as some may think, and they are actually a fairly recent mm -hmm. vintage. So I thought that was an interesting yeah. approach. And it talks about, like, if I understood this correctly, it, it's sort of alluding to the Fomorian dream and the Fomorian courts for Thalane, but it doesn't really have Fomorians. That's right. Yeah. yeah. You could either see the true Fomorians as locked in an iron prison in the deepest hell, mm -hmm. or the Fomorians are a mistranslation of a Chinese text <laughs> that was you know, translated to Arabic and Greek. Either one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I kind of like the gremlin take, too, the frailty. Mm. It's better than just their their thing blows up. They're like, <laughs> yeah. I wanted to make sure, because I, I knew I wanted an example of Thalane, and I wanted mm -hmm. them to be, because I, I don't want to be too negative. got to keep it positive, right? But C20, those Thalane, some of them are gross, man. They're <laughs> yeah. It's like, these are so nasty. No, thank you. Oh, yeah. And Goblins are a good, uh, a good way to go if you don't want to go. <laughs> yeah, if you want to make them clearly still dark, but not maybe i don't want this as, in, as an antagonist even in my game yeah and I, so. I wanted to make sure that that it was a kinship that is kind of pitiful and you can see why they would take this mm -hmm. route but you still can't let them be what they are mm -hmm. yeah. they're still dangerous but they're not let's have serious safety tools before introducing mm -hmm. this antagonist to yeah. <laughs> they're just happy-go-lucky destructors yeah well we end with a character sheet yeah that also makes you head of land of eight million dreams <laughs> <laughs> There are two more listener questions. Before we get to them, I just want to say job well done because this yes. is a massive undertaking and I think you rose to the challenge sufficiently. <laughs> and uh, Thank you. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm... This is one of my favorite Changeling books now. Hey. <laughs> of like all of, I'm not just talking story filler fault, like just in general. That makes it's, me it's, so uh... happy. Thank you. Yeah. So, all right, two questions. Yes. Seb asks, since power over time was meant to be gained via enlightened alchemy, do you think it's still plausible for the equivalent of the Kronos art or a general time art to exist in, in the realm of gods and dreams? Ah, Kronos art. Yeah, you could have that as a worldly element. So I'm going to make a version two of this document that has cl rules, clarifications, and things. I think if you're if you're in the business of making custom arts, you're going to want to think in terms of art families. You're not just going to want to make one. You're mm. probably going to want to think of at least like three. Yeah. So that when you do incorporate those things, they make sense in context of each other. So yes, you could theoretically make something like Kronos. Um, I could imagine the subtle element, something like. Well, you have memory as one of them, don't you? Isn't that? Um, connection is one of them but yeah no memory could be a yeah. good subtle element i think but yeah so you could design that but you would probably want to think of what else would fit with time what other arts mm -hmm. you'd want to make together with that as far as enlightened alchemy goes i know the first power is to redo a choice you could still have that i think it's fine especially since it's the first one groovy and then fetch asks but i also wanted to ask with ulterior motives are there any more games that you want to revise so i'm tired <laughs> <laughs> uh at the moment yeah. i finished this book and i was like oh this is great and then i realized oh my god i've been working on year of the lotus for depending on how you count it two to three years and i'm already thinking like maybe some kind of supplement that is like supplemental information for the last two books the hungry dead and the little gods mm -hmm. something like that maybe but honestly i have to rest and think of what's good this one took me 16 months, I think. Basically, yeah. I finished Relentless Age in April. And somebody just randomly said, you know, I, you know, you are a fan of the Shen. Maybe you should work on the Shen. And that's when the gear started turning. So I would count it from there. Yeah, 16 months. But yeah, I mean, I, I was saying this on a thread on RPG. And I, I like the way that the Half Devils turned out. I think they're, they're kind of lovable in an odd way. Maybe I'll go there. But yeah, we'll see, really. I don't think anyone would complain if you wanted to take on Demon, but just huh. putting that out there. You know. I love Demon. I think you should do it as a supplement of this book. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I realized I, I forgot the question about the epithets for the three tribes. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. Uh, so Seb asks, where did the epithets for the three different tribes come from? Specifically, the epithets Peach Blossom Tribe for the Celestials, Toadstool Tribe for the Earthblooded, and Anis Tribe for the Dreamborn. So I knew I wanted the tribes to have floral themes. Just, I don't know, because the, their main emblem is an open lotus. I wanted more of that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a setting design thing. Um, 
I'm sure both of you having worked on books know this too. Like sometimes you can just put a little nugget of flavor and it, and people can fill in the blanks for you. And it's, it's a lot of fun that way. Mm-hmm. So I wanted that some epithets that kind of, you know, that, that you could Im- imply more meaning for the celestials, the peach blossom, of course, if, if you know your botany, you know that, you know, flowers come before the fruits when they ripen. So peaches are, you know, they're very much associated with the heavens, you know, the monkey king stole peaches and that's why he got in trouble. One of the many times he got in trouble. So that's why I chose peach blossoms for the celestials. Toadstool for earth blooded. So I I knew I I liked the idea of mushrooms because I feel like those are very of the earth. Hmm. And toadstools specifically in English, I don't know if there's an equivalent term in Chinese or Japanese or any other language, but toadstools are specifically poison mushrooms or psychedelic mushrooms, things that will mess you up. So I wanted that kind of edge to the earth blooded that, you know, they are not to be trifled with. They see themselves as the firstborn, the real ones who deserve to be on earth. Um, so that's why I picked toadstool for them. And then dreamborn, this one's kind of a, it's a, it's a herbology deep cut. So, <laughs> so star anise, there are two big types. One is Chinese star anise. That's the flavorful stuff that you put into Chinese food and it makes it taste kind of, you know, herbaceous and delicious, right? Japanese star anise looks like Chinese anise, but it will kill you. Oh. Or if it will not kill you, it will give you a very bad time. Yeah, so I wanted to give that that idea of like, well, people, you know, like there are a significant contingent of gods who see these, these particular ones and say like, they're not really gods. They're more like poison fake gods. That's why I chose that. I have a jar of it in my cabinet, and I hope it's the right kind. Uh, there have been <laughs> there have been cases where the Japanese ceramics got mixed in, but you know, eat, eat a little bit, you'll you'll have some visions, and you'll be fine. I'll let my guests eat it first. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think that I think that that's it. Just about wraps it up, except for us to ask that if mm-hmm. people are interested in knowing which game you'll be developing next. Uh, or if they are curious about other work that you're doing, where can they find you around the interwebs? I'm sorry, I don't have a social media presence. Um, Never apologize for that. That is 100% <laughs> reasonable. Are, are you still on RPG Net? <laughs> oh, yes, yes, I'm on RPG Net. And um, yeah. honestly, you know, like live drafting has been so fun and so rewarding. I've shared these stories and, and you know, everybody I've interacted with, uh, it's, it's just been a ball, but I'm not sure that, that I'll be doing it again for future works but i will be keeping people mm-hmm. appraised of what i'm doing probably there very occasionally i'm on i'm on reddit to promote my stuff so i might be mm-hmm. there as well please don't send me any reddit chats i i, I feel so guilty when i <laughs> <laughs> it's been like three months and someone's like hey yeah that's not a good feeling well so, i would like yeah. to urge people to when they go purchase the book that will be in the show notes for this episode that they should leave a review and a comment to, and that's that's an easy way to give some feedback positive feedback don't go leaving trash on storyteller's fault yeah yeah and um and if you have any questions the rpg net thread is is open right now and until i'm ready to start making the v2 document um and there's one on reddit as well um if, if you're more comfortable with that links to these will also be provided in the show notes to this episode okay so, uh, and if you want to contact us, you can send us an email, podcast at changingthepodcast.com. You can listen to us on YouTube and leave comments there as well for Changing the Podcast. You can go on our Discord, and you do not have to be a patron, but you can go to, you can if you'd like, uh, to uh, discord.me slash ctp. If you do want to be a Patreon, we're on Patreon at uh, Changing the Podcast. We're also on Facebook for Changing the Podcast. And we're on Matt Mastodon, uh, changelingpod at dice.camp. And of course, our website, changelingthepodcast.com. Links to all of these shall, imagine this, also be provided in the show notes. And uh, once again, I'm Josh. I remain Puka. I now, I now really want to have like a Puka as the kith, but like you're incarnated as a dog, like a cat. You know, I'll, I'll work on it, all right? Yeah, I'll make a you kinship can do that, for it. yeah. <laughs> yeah, a kinship cat, cat, Puka kinship with a dog. There we go. <laughs> but thank you again, Sebastian, and... Yeah. May we all live in less interesting times. Thank Thank you, you. and I agree. 
To get into the little god mindset for this episode, we try to open our awareness to the kind of prayers that we might have to answer as part of our podcaster duties. We were quickly overwhelmed by the number of requests for a Changeling 5th edition, the wistful hopes for someone to make the anime playable, and an avalanche of pleas for someone to run an online game in each individual prayer's time zone where they can play the character of the bespoke kith that they've made, or perhaps, keeping with this episode's theme, kinship. While unfortunately we can't fulfill all such requests, we believe that conversation within the fan base can, and we encourage listeners to communicate with each other wherever social space allows. Obviously, this includes our Discord server at www.discord.me ctp, where you can talk game talk and bother us to your heart's content. Special thanks go out for the support of our patrons as well, who include Derek, Dorkadus, Elorus, Iabol, Oreo, Roscobuz, Sandshaker, Sija, Terry Robinson, Triceraveth, and Victor Torre. If you'd like to help us keep the lights on and get a shout-out like that at the end of each episode, stop by www.patreon.com slash changelingthepodcast and consider signing up. Reviews are also always appreciated on the podcast listening platform of your greatest convenience. Thanks so much for your attention, and wash thoroughly behind your soul to get rid of those pesky bits of defilement, without which it will no doubt be all the easier to keep on dreaming.